Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the London Assembly's plenary meeting. In accordance with uh, government regulations, we are holding this meeting on a virtual basis with Assembly members and invited guests participating today. Before we go into the meeting, can I ask the clerk, Rebecca Arnold, to confirm the names of the Assembly members who are virtually present at this meeting and uh, any apologies for absence? Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Assembly members. We have with us today virtually uh, Assembly member Bailey, Assembly member Berry, Assembly member Boff, Assembly member Cooper, Assembly member Desai, Assembly member Devonish, Assembly member Dismore, Assembly member Duval, Assembly member uh, Eshalomi MP, Assembly member Gavron, Assembly member Hall, Assembly member Curtin, Assembly member McCartney, Assembly member Moore, Assembly member O'Connell, Assembly member Pigeon, Assembly member Prince, Assembly member Qureshi. Assembly Member Russell, Assembly Member Dr. Sahota, Assembly Member Whittle, uh, Assembly Member Arbor, Deputy Chairman, and yourself, Assembly Member Shah, the Chair. We have apologies from uh, Assembly Member Arnold and Assembly Member Bacon, MP, and we have a number of guests with this Chair who I know you will uh, welcome shortly. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I have a couple of uh, Chair's announcements. Uh, on Monday, the Environment Committee reviewed the impact of COVID-19 on the delivery of the Mayor of London's environmental policies. And on Tuesday, the GLA Oversight Committee looked into the proposed relocation of, of City Hall to the Crystal and concerns surrounding the proposal, including our standing as seat of uh, London government, accessibility, finance, security, etc. Moving on to declarations of interest, can I ask the Assembly to note the recommendation set out at item two? Agreed. Thank you. Can I ask the Assembly members to declare any disclosable pecuniary interests or other relevant interests where they relate to the items on the agenda for today's meeting? No. I believe there are none, so we move on uh, to the next item, which is uh, minutes. Can I ask the Assembly to confirm the minutes of the London Assembly's plenary meeting held on 2nd July? to be signed by me as correct record. Great. Thank you. Uh, we now move on to question and answer session. Uh, and today's principal business is question and answer session on the economic recovery in London. I'm pleased to say that joining us for today's session, we have Jordan Cummins, head of London Policy, Confederation of uh, British Industry, that's uh, CBI. Jace Tyrrell, Chief Executive, New West End Company. Rowena Harvey, who is London Policy Chair, Federation of Small Business. Uh, we have John Dickey, who is the Director of Strategy and Policy of London First. We have Sam Gurney, Regional Secretary, Trade Union Congress, London East and South East. Uh, we also have Councillor Georgina Gould, uh, who is the Local Enterprise Partnership for London, uh, board member and chair of the London Recovery Task Force's Economic Recovery Working Group. Uh, we have Richard Burge, who is the chief executive of London Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And finally, we have uh, Philip Graham, GLA Executive Director of Good Growth. A large but strong panel, and uh, we look forward to uh, having uh, uh, our discussions with uh, the invited guests. So welcome to the meeting, everyone. Uh, there will be a lead of question from me as chair to Jordan Cummings, who is the head of London policy at the CBI, after which uh, assembly members uh, uh, will put supplementary questions to our guests. So please, could I ask assembly members to specify also who they would like to answer uh, from when they put that question so that uh, we, we know exactly who the question is addressed to uh, and uh, for the guests, we would be grateful for succinct answers, please, so that you can get through all the questions we have for you today. So the first opening question is from me to Jordan Cummins. What are the main challenges for London's economy as it emerges and recovers from uh, the impact of COVID-19? Thank you. John, Jordan. Uh Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thanks for inviting uh, the CBI to speak. Um, it's fair to say that this has been a challenging few months for businesses of all shapes and sizes and all sectors for that matter. 
um, when addressing, I guess, the challenges for, for the recovery for the recovery for the capital going forward. I think there are there are a series that probably come in short, medium, and long term. I think if we were to group them, um, the the issues that our members uh, are bringing up uh, more readily than not in the kind of short term category uh, are reliance on the transport network, which of course we have quite heavily in London. Um, and they're looking at things like modelling the return in the autumn, how fast businesses can come back, and, and, and real-time data that, that firms would really love to have from TfL to kind of avoid the peaks where possible. Um, within that, looking at our international counterparts, New York, Paris, Hong Kong, there seems to be an eerily consistent challenge with those international cities as well as us. So this isn't just London. Um, moving beyond the transport network, I would say spatial planning for offices and, and implementing social distancing while returning to work, uh, coinciding those two things is, is a real challenge. Uh, the rise in unemployment, which we may see in the autumn, um, very, uh, very high on businesses. Businesses are generally at the moment and they want to keep as many people as they possibly can. So utilising the schemes that are out there is still top of the list for business. Consumer confidence also in the short term is, is exceptionally, exceptionally important and will be at the heart of any recovery for London. Uh, and housing costs is something that has come up uh, quite recently with a lot of businesses, um, with, with many people kind of falling into arrears, uh, even, into, even into kind of uh, salary demographics that we've not seen before. So in the short term, those are the, those are the things that our members are bringing up uh, in terms of challenges to overcome. In the midterm, I think we can see things like footfall and, and the shift from consumer confidence to consumer habits and how that impacts central London specifically. Uh, the usage of space in inner London and, and the evolution of um, some of the, the mayor's uh, introductions such as street space and where that goes, the reliance on, on, on kind of deliveries and 24 hour service, especially in retail and hospitality. And the interaction with things like street space is something that, that our members have been raising quite, quite readily recently. Um, and then moving forward into kind of road charging and the evolution of, of that street spaces and, and, and how, uh, how we balance that kind of green recovery tension, I guess, with, with road charging and, and then supply our businesses, in, especially if, along things like Regent Street. And then I guess in the long term, just finally, um, productivity and skills drivers, how London boroughs, I guess, work with businesses more closely to, to perhaps turn job centres into kind of skills hubs and really get people ready for work rather than just signposting them to jobs. Um, longer term kind of focus on commuting. So perhaps we might see a shift from uh, 45 to 60 minute commutes to kind of 20 to 30 minute commuting and how that impacts the outer London boroughs, perhaps with less people coming into zone one, that might be something we see. And then finally, um, you know, businesses often raise uh, what can the GLA and, and, and government do within the kind of fiscal lever framework they have to kind of give a bit more headspace um, to, the, to, the, to the mayor and, and, and the capacity at, at local government to kind of ease the burden and, and the impact of COVID-19. Uh, and, and lots of members raise things like tourist taxes and, and a lot of levers that, that exist in international counterparts. So in the longer term, I guess, kind of interesting funding models um, for infrastructure, but also for cash flow for the for local government to help businesses. Um, so those are the kind of short, medium and, and long term issues that our members are raising with us past most. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jordan. Uh, you have uh, focused uh, and talked about your strategy for uh, central London, which uh, I appreciate. But something which you can also let us know, uh, not now, but perhaps in writing, as to whether uh, how you are addressing issues surrounding outer London areas as well which will have huge impact on uh, the whole economic recovery. Uh, so if, if you can bear that in mind, I would now like to move on to supplementary lead questions uh, from uh, members. Uh, first in order, I have uh, Assembly Member Cooper, uh, who has the first question, please. Assembly Member Cooper. Uh Thank you very much, Chair. Um, my question is um, to Jordan. Thanks very much for that um, introductory statement. Um, small and large businesses have had to adapt their business models, as you were pointing out, and all of their ways of working to deal with the pandemic situation since March. Um, but obviously from September, they face the prospect of having to change their business models again to adapt to the uh, changes that will come at the end of December with the, the no deal um, Brexit. And obviously, Carolyn Fairbairn has had a lot to say about the uh, Brexit situation. And I just wondered if you could say to us whether or not you think that um, London businesses have the bandwidth to recover from the impact of the coronavirus in time to prepare for the no deal Brexit. It's a, a good and fair question. I think, uh, in short, uh, we would struggle to say that every business does have the bandwidth. I think we've been quite vocal 
Lance about the fact that COVID-19 really has sucked up quite a lot of the resilience mm. that the business community had stored for Brexit. Um, I think the, the paramount is, of course, to get a deal as, and, and to kind of get the heads of terms of those deal out as fast as is humanly possible so that firms have a good idea about how big the playing field is and how level that playing field might be. But I do think it would be a stretch to say that every single business is, is really ready, especially not for a, a catastrophic no-deal Brexit as we see it. Um, there just isn't the, the bandwidth, I think, not least uh, in terms of time, but also fiscal capacity at boardroom level. Uh, is is really quite constrained and, and a lot of businesses are on kind of skeleton staff at the moment so the capacity to plan really is quite low i would say yeah i mean i think that's uh, why i'm in the, the economy committee um not unanimously um but uh with, with my, which i chair we wrote to the chancellor of the duchy of lancaster because obviously there's been a hold up with the negotiations to say you know, perhaps the uh, the the uh, not that Brexit should be cancelled, but the uh, you know the transitional period should be extended. Um, and so, what you've just said is quite worrying. And obviously, the mayor has been calling for that extension as well. Um, a lot of people uh, stockpiled things in the lead up to the 31st of October 2019, when when we previously thought we were going to uh, leave. Um, do you think businesses have been able to do that this time? Again, I think I would say probably a much less so. You know, this is a this is primarily a health crisis we're in, but it has a huge knock on economic crisis. Mm. And not least, you have businesses who have constrained cash flow, but you also have businesses who staff have contained have contracted coronavirus. Staff have unfortunately passed from coronavirus. There is a huge knock on impact to people's mental resilience. I think across businesses at the moment, and there is a real tension between firms wanting to do the best for their local communities but also not wanting to put people in harm's way sooner than they want than they really should be doing uh, and i think all of that is combining just to just to really constrain people's time to stockpile i would say in in the, in the same manner that they did last year we are in a very very different economic landscape uh, and i don't think that we should especially as we move away from the the, the start of the kind of uh, the really tricky early part of the of, of the virus into this kind of next planning stage we shouldn't yeah. forget that there are quite a lot of small businesses, as Rowena will attest to, that are gasping for breath still. Um, and sure. we are, uh, we have a lot of support, but but the, the support is going to tail off. And I guess the planning in those smaller firms for what happens when that tails off uh, is going to be really tough. Yeah, I, th I, th I think I think that's right. I wonder if I could bring in Phil Graham at this point. I mean, as I just said, the Economy Committee uh, wrote to uh, Michael Gove to ask for an extension, um, but two Assembly members from the Conservative group didn't support it and said any further delays uh, to Brexit and an extension to the transitional period would increase uncertainty, which in the midst of the pandemic is the last thing that London needs. And I wondered if that is something that you're hearing from businesses, that everybody's very keen um, to go straight through with the no-deal Brexit. Uh, and I'd be grateful if you could be brief, because I'm relatively short of time now. Thank you. And I, I think I was at the, participated in the Mayor's Business Advisory Board recently, which is one of the main routes through which we, we engage with, with business, um, and particularly business at a senior level. I would say the, picture, the, the business position, and I mean, Rowena and, and uh, Jordan will come back on this as well, is much more nuanced than that. I mean, clearly... There is a there is a desire for stability and certainty because businesses need that to plan. Um, but I think within that there that need for stability and certainty they they see depending on what business they're in as needing to be balanced against getting the right arrangements in place with the European Union to be able to to succeed in the long over the longer over the longer term. So I don't I don't think the business position is as is as simple as. Can we please just know what's happening so we can get on with it? I think the business position is that we need to have, a, we need to be able to see a world in which we're moving to a st stable position, but we can't just throw every sort of protection and every, uh, every every advantage that we might gain through a good deal out of the window to secure that. But, but Jordan and Rowena, who have their own business members, and John indeed, may, may be sure. able to come in and, and, and say okay. more about that. Well, unfortunately, I haven't got time for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, next question is from uh, Assembly Member Russell. 
thank you, Chair, and good morning, everyone. And thank you to this huge panel for joining us. And I'm only sorry I'm not going to be able to ask questions to all of you because there are things I'd like to ask each of you. Um, there are a lot of representatives here from businesses and industry. And I want to make sure that we keep in mind today the people that aren't actually in the meeting. That's the workers, the recently unemployed, the furloughed, and the young people that this crisis is hitting the hardest. We know from the recent poverty profile published by Trust for London that poverty um, is higher in London than in any other region in the UK. And despite a small increase in the employment rate, 200,000 more Londoners are living in poverty now than five years ago. So my first question is for Phil Graham. As Executive Director for Good Growth, what are you, your team and the Mayor doing to ensure that the economic recovery is going to benefit all Londoners, particularly those who might fall through the gaps in the government's safety net? Thank you. Well, the, the first thing it's really important to say is that throughout this, this crisis, the mayor has been advocating very strongly for those gaps that exist in the government's safety net to be, to be plugged. And we continue to do so. And there has been some success in that. For example, the both the uh, the um, switch to provide a stronger safety net for self-employed and freelance workers, and the move that we've seen more recently towards systems whereby the furlough scheme can also apply to to workers coming back part time, are you know, are things that the mayor has been specifically specifically calling for, and we're pleased to see those put in place. Alongside that, however, I mean, there is a there is a huge amount that we need to do to support people at every level, and in particular to support people from some of our more disadvantaged communities who have been hit particularly hard by this. I mean, we've seen across the COVID crisis that it has hit community, BME community, black and minority ethnic communities, it's hit women harder, and there's an enormous amount to do on that. Our employment and skills team are working extremely hard through the Skills for Londoners board to ensure that the uh, the programmes that we have in place are flexed to be able to to respond to the crisis and are um, and are putting um, putting putting flexibilities in place to make sure that some of the some of the contractual issues that the, that the crisis has has developed are are not a problem to providing support and help to people. We've done a huge amount. Um, to ensure to tackle food poverty, we continue to look at fuel poverty through our warmer home service, and there's a lot that's in the day job that we're just continuing to focus on as this crisis has gone on to make sure that we can help. But alongside that, you know, we are cl cl clear that you know addressing poverty, both existing and new, pov new, new poverty that might have occurred, addressing unemployment ensuring that there is a there is a, a positive future for young people need to be critical planks of the recovery program and they are the types of things that we are talking about as the as the key strands of that in terms of the missions that we might take forward thank you um it, it would also have been good to hear a bit about the young londoners fund um because i think you're doing some work through that but i'll i'm, I'm going to actually um move on um and it is uh, it's good to hear that you you have been lobbying government. It's really important, um, uh, you know, when we know that data from Excluded UK, for instance, tell us that uh, three million people nationally have been excluded from that government support. That's about 10% of the workforce. It is really important that uh, that you keep up with that work to make sure that people aren't falling through those gaps. I'm actually going to move now to um, Georgia Gould. Um, and um, to look at uh, one of the groups in London who are hardest hit by the economic impacts of coronavirus, and that's young people. They're at risk of becoming a, a lost generation. And on top of the severe disruption to their education, young people's access to travel is under threat, a third have been furloughed or lost their job completely, and all of this is likely to scar their pay and prospects for years to come. Um, they're also likely to be working in the sectors that are hardest hit by um, coronavirus, like hospitality, tourism and retail. So, Georgia, what is the London Recovery Task Force doing specifically to support young people? Yeah, I think it's, it's an incredibly important question. And we've seen um, through this crisis 
that it's shone a light on the deep inequalities that, that we see in, in our city um, and the poverty in our city. And, and young people have, have been one of the groups hit hardest by it. And, and speaking to young people, they've talked to, about their, their, their fears of um, what, coming out of, of, of education into um, a labour market that doesn't have any opportunities. We've, we've seen the kind of extent of the, the digital divide and how that's cut off many young people from learning. So it's a it's a key focus. Um, but Phil talked a bit about the kind of missions we're developing, and one will absolutely be be focused on opportunities for young people, ensuring that the young Londoners are in employment, education, and training. And we've already been working together as as far as with, with the GLA to to bring a, to bring that wraparound support for for young people in our in our local places. But we're really concerned about some. Of these national decisions, the, the imposition of um, the removal of under-18 travel on um, on TfL is is going to hit some of our poorest and most disadvantaged entrepreneurs at a time when they desperately need free travel to get to cultural resources, to get into education. We just, you know, it is is such a retrograde step, and it's something that we, um, uh, as boroughs, um, are absolutely standing with with the mayor in, in pushing back on on that decision. Um, but I think there is a lot we can do um, positively, um, and uh, some of the, the, the kind of key areas we're, we're working on is addressing some of the trauma that has come from this, um, and, and taking a trauma-informed approach as, as young people go back into to education. Looking at opportunities over over the summer period um, for um, for involvement in positive activities for young people, and that, uh, as I said, the um, employment, education, and training piece. Um, and, and finally, digital access. And I think that um, we always we already knew the digital divide was was a huge issue um, in London. But I think this has really shone a light in my in my own borough. Um, Four thousand um, young people didn't have access to um, either a device or broadband to, to learn during during the crisis. Um, and and I think that we really want to work on uh, on a project that brings digital access um, to Londoners, and, and we're we're mobilising around that. Thank you. Um, certainly, the kind of the digital access piece is is a is a huge issue. As a council leader, are you getting support coming through to your borough? And how easy are you are kind of the services finding it to transition support, like sort of youth club support or support for disabled young people, learning disabled young people? And use groups onto platforms like Zoom. I'm getting very low on time, just to alert you. <laughs> okay. uh, yes, we are. We are. Um, we're opening our youth clubs. We're doing a big um, summer program, um, and we've just done a, a virtual work experience with 250 young people. So, so we are transitioning, but it, it isn't the same. And there is, you know, there is this this real need um, that young people are, are facing. And in terms of digital support, yeah, the, the scheme. Um, it's still leaving huge gaps. We still have um, over a thousand young people who don't have access, um, and and the funding gaps we face um, is still an existential challenge. Youth services still discretionary. They've been they've been some of the hardest hit by austerity, and most of our boroughs are still um, well. You know, we've had just over 19 million from government. We've got an 83 million gap um, still as a borough, and so. You know, it puts all of those kind of discretionary services at risk. So, so funding for local government is absolutely critical um, for support for young people. Thank you. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Can we move on to a question from uh, Assembly Member Vittel? Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning to to the panel. Um, my question, uh, really, I think. I'll have to ask you all, and maybe someone can answer it. Um, it's just about London's, uh, if you want to call it, cultural industry. I, I don't mean by that necessarily the creative industry. I mean uh, in terms of theatre, in terms of performing arts, in terms of all the things that make up a huge part of London life and, of course, the economy. Um, what are your views on the future of that? How do you see that going? We have actually had... Uh, very, uh, very worrying um, statements from, for example, the likes of Cameron McIntosh that even his very big commercial shows will not now work until next year. I'm thinking particularly of the sheer volume of restaurants and bars and all of these things that rely on this sector for their survival. 
how do you see it panning out? What, what is your view on it? Uh, I, I Really, it's open to anybody who wants to answer me. Nobody wants to answer me. Um, should, I, should, I, should, I, should I come in first and, and yes. others can come forward? Yes. I mean, because one of my responsibilities is for the GLA culture team. I mean, the, there is no doubt that the future is, that the, the coming months, the future looks very, very difficult for that sector. Um, you know, it has been decimated. No one, it's, it's, in, it's pretty much impossible to plan for your doors being forced to shut for anything between six months and a year. And in, in another life, I'm the chair of a small theater in Camden. And you know, the, the theater that I, the, that theater is, you know, we are, we are talking on an almost, on, a, on an incredibly regular basis about how difficult the financial challenge is. Um, the mayor's obviously tried to, tried to, is stepping into this. We've expanded our culture at risk office. We've put in place a 2.3 million culture at risk fund to support some of the venues that might otherwise be at risk. Um, and the government's 1.5 billion package is incredibly welcome, but we wait to see how that will be allocated. But I think the flip side of that is what we are starting to see is theatres who are run by creative people and are highly able to innovate are starting to adapt. That's not changing the existential pressures that they face. They're adapting in incredibly different circumstances. But whilst I think it's going to be an incredibly rocky few few months, there is every chance that we are going to lose venues that are precious to the sector and to the to the uh, communities they serve. I'm, optimistic that the, the that the sector will will adjust itself will find a will find a way through but that is it's going to be incredibly difficult and it's not going to be the cultural sector when we emerge from this crisis looking exactly the same as it was when it came in it is going to have to adapt and, and change uh, well, uh, thank you very much sir. when you say adapt and change uh, uh, my concern really is that if the various social distancing uh, measures uh, stay in force um, you know, and it appears to be the case that they are going to be sort of like without end at the moment. Uh, indeed, it are intensifying with the new mask uh, coming into more, you know, the mandatory masking. Uh, you're talking about things never actually being able to operate like they were before. I mean, the thing is, aren't these things that we've actually got to face as a ra as rather than just simply saying these are challenges? I mean, if you're talking about theatre, for example, you know, you're talking about actors on stage. They, you know, how can you possibly do a play if you have to socially distance and all of this kind of thing? Um, I, I'm not just trying to make a point about theatre, because the fact is, is, as you just obviously understand, there is a mass of commerce around this sector. I mean, and you're talking about basically the whole of the West End, which, frankly, I think it's not too strong a point to say it's facing a kind of extinction-level event, actually. Uh um, I, I absolutely take the point about the critical importance of the of the sector. And, yeah. and interestingly, when we sat down and spoke to them, I mentioned the, the Mayor's Business Advisory Board recently, you know, a, this group of people who were from McKinsey and you know big businesses, one of their one of their biggest areas of concern was the future of the culture, the cultural sector in London, because it is so, so important in terms of creating the kind of city that attracts investment and so on. But I should hand over to Rowena, who wants to... Thank you. Who would like to... Thank you. Um, institutions for Cultures and the Arts have been very clear about the help and support that they required, and they were right to speak up and loudly. Uh, there has been some level of contribution there. From my point of view, from Federation of Small Business, and small business includes micro-businesses, um, there is so many self-employed workers working in the creative field and they provide the backbone of the West End and the support systems for those larger institutions. Your points are very correct and I'd say from a small bit micro business kind of point of view um, is if this prolongs not only are uh, self-employed people challenged in their income but are they going to have to seek other avenues of work? Are they going to stop doing though that kind of work in the interim? Um, when we talk about support and when we talk about the future, I think we really need to take into account the huge number of people involved in culture and the arts, not just the bigger organisations. Uh, I would totally agree with that. Um, I wasn't necessarily mentioning the bigger 
uh, organizations. But um, I, from what I can understand, the government's bailout, as it, if you want to call it that, actually does make provision for those big institutions. Mm -hmm. But I think th th the fact is that we can go on, you know, all the time recognizing how difficult it's going to be without actually coming up with something. I mean, if, if theatres, uh, for example, or any performing space, uh, they will be reduced to 30% capacity. As you know, it takes about 67%, 70% for them to even break even. I mean, if this thing carries on, and as I understand it, we're sort of, the idea is we carry on until there's some vaccine or something, it's going to wipe out the whole sector. It is actually going to wipe it out. That why don't we look at it that way? I mean, you know, don't drastic measures need to be taken? I mean, you know, in terms of social distancing, relaxing it? Assembly Member Whittle, I've got uh, Councillor Gould, Jordan Cummins, and uh, Jess Tyrell, they've indicated. Would you want to hear from them? Shall I bring please. them in? Yes, please. Uh, okay, can we have Councillor Gould, please? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely agree about the existential challenge. And it is, you know, the creative industries and culture gives us one in six jobs for, for London. And so it's absolutely critical for our productivity. I mean, I do think it needs a, it needs more than the bailout. We need a specific scheme, which is, which is some kind of extension of the furlough that allows these organisations, their performance um, venues to survive. And I think live music and theatre have used that out as a, the two kind of critical elements of that and, and, and the point about freelancers and it, um, extending the self-employed scheme for this particular industry because we, we can't afford in London for, for that to, to disappear. But I also think as we're looking at reinvigorating our high streets, there are opportunities to bring um, culture to our streets, to our open spaces, to be creative about how we um, culture for, for new audiences across London. Um, and those are some of the things we're looking at. But there is a fundamental lobbying point um, that we need um, to, to protect um, this, this whole area because it for London's future. And it, it's, it goes beyond the, the next um, couple of months, in my view. Right. Uh, Jordan Cummings, do you still want to come in? Uh, really just to echo Georgia on the fundamental lobbying point, but also I think as a as an industry that is central, as we say, to London's growth, just like the higher education sector who are looking at fundamentally the impact of COVID-19 on the funding model of their entire business, they will not be alone in terms of, you know, big anchor sectors across London that probably now need to do that. Um, and it's not their fault. They've run on this model for a long time. It's been exceptionally uh, beneficial for the city. But if we are, as you say, uh, Councillor Whittle, to, to, to carry on in this stage until we run until there is a vaccine, there will be several industries who will have to undertake probably some kind of assessment in terms of their you know, financial viability when, things, uh, are, are, when the sun isn't shining. And I think that there is more work across industries to do to help that. So you know, people working with their supply chains, there's, there's more of a role for bigger businesses to look at how things change, how we bring into the, uh, bring into the fold those, those new things that uh, Councillor Gould was mentioning about different types of service provision, digital service provision, a hybrid of physical and digital. And there is more, I think, the business community can do to help each other, uh, which is where I guess that we see, we see our role to kind of help that. Uh, thank you, Jordan. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time uh, with this particular question. So may I please uh, ask uh, uh, or request uh, Jay Tyrell and uh, Sam Gurney, who wanted to come in on this, to write us in about uh, your uh, uh, so views uh, on uh, the, the culture sector question that was raised by Assembly Member Whittle. So if you can move on to the next uh, uh, supplementary lead question, and that's from uh, Assembly Member Bailey. Assembly can Member you hear me Bailey. all? Yes. Can you hear me, Chair? Yes, I can. Yes, Thank I you. Can. Good, good, good morning to all. Good morning to all our guests. I'd just like to finish this point about the cultural the culture industry in London, because of course we have a visitor economy and this is basically what those people are visiting is our huge variety of culture and the scale of the culture. But what kind of intervention are we looking for in monetary terms? I think if we're approaching the government and asking for more money, do, can we give that a figure? Can we give it a ballpark? What kind of monies are we talking about? Why, why don't I start with Philip and, and, and then move on? Uh, thank you. I mean, I, mean I, I, I don't have 
a specific figure because this this breaks up across a number of areas. I mean, Councillor Gould identified the importance of thinking about how the how the the sort of employment support schemes continue to support the sectors that have been strongest hit. Um, and others have talked about, about other elements of the challenge. But I would say, you know, the culture and the, the culture and the creative industry sector, together with sort of the, the tourism sector and how, how they support us, contribute, you know, in the region of uh, of 58 billion to the capital's economy a year. And as I think someone else said, they account for one in six jobs. So, you know, if you're talking about an, an industry of that scale and an impact that could decimate that, you know, could reduce that by a really material sum, then you know, 1.5 billion at national level is a great start. But, you know, that that pales into insignificance against the size of this industry just in London. So, you know, we are talking as we talk about how you rethink the financial model for this industry, um, as uh, Jordan said, we need to be clear about the need for, a, for, for long term support. And that may mean thinking differently about how that's provided as well as simply what the scale of the number is. OK, thank you. Um, Rowena, would you have anything to add to that? Um, I'm not going to go for a big picture number. I'm going to boil it down into something much smaller. And that would be looking to the future and looking to create jobs and the apprenticeship that has been brought up and the 2000 funding towards that. I'd say a big concern for small business, London small businesses, is that 2000 would not be enough to um, actually uh, bring about bringing uh, young people into a company. Um, our small businesses, we're, we're, we're lobbying the mayor for uh, maybe a match funding on that amount to help small businesses create those jobs going forward. So rather than present a bigger picture, fix it number, I'm going to say these are the small additional things. Are you going to put those kind of numbers into that bigger picture? OK. Um, Councillor Gould, do, do, a comment there? I mean, I think the most fundamental um, thing that would make a difference is extending the furlough scheme um, but both for those hardest hit cultural um, bodies that can't reopen due to social distancing and for um, self-employed workers. So I, I don't know how much that, that comes to, but I would look at a specific se sector deal, um, recognising the importance um, of investing in this area. Well, uh, um, this question I just to, to, to Philip, if of course, if we're going, if the mayor's going to have this ask, surely the work needs to be done by the, by the mayor's office, the GLA, around what that looks like, what it costs, who it would be for. If we're going to support one industry above another, there has to be a justification for that. And is that a piece of work that's been looked at by your office? And we, we, we are looking all the time at how we can best support the arts and cultural sector and what support it and how how what we should be seeking from government to be a part of that and you know that has been reflected in the government in the 1.5 billion package that's in place at the moment i think what we need to see now is how that is implemented what the impacts of that on on london are whilst continuing as jo as councillor gould says to lobby for the ongoing employment support and also cultural um the ongoing employment support that the culture sector is probably going to need Okay, thank you. I'd just like to slightly change tack and, and talk about um, talk to Jordan first about your your concept around short and medium and long term the the changes that that need to be made. And um, what are your members asking for around the reliance on the transport network? You made a comment that we are very reliant on it for our economic activity, which is, which is clear. What are your members looking for to help them to support a return back to higher levels of income? Thanks, Councillor Bailey. Um, there's probably two main things. I think uh, the the real time data point comes up quite a lot from members who have quite a heavy office space in, in zone one. So uh, generally, uh, uh, people talk in the cluster in kind of Canary Wharf and people know what's going on. But there's also a very huge professional services cluster across the central line. Um, and I think uh, real time data that businesses could tap into to know where the peaks are and when to avoid, aside from the capsule TFL, uh, peak time is, is is always really really helpful, but but the accessibility of that data and, and, and kind of privacy is, is sometimes a challenge, and we know that. Um, but also, uh, I think, and this is something working with TFL on, is the kind of uh, the the timeline for modelling. And if firms are looking at the autumn to perhaps start bringing back 20, 30, 40 percent of their workforce, 
that really is a moot point if 20, 30, 40 percent of their workforce can't actually physically get on the network. So I think a real timeline for kind of uh, TFL modeling as to when the percentages might come up from where they are, and I think they're still only about two or three in 10, uh, is really, really helpful for firms to basically align that with the network, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, I'd, I'd ask the same question to Rowena. Are, are, your, are, you, are small businesses massively impacted? Or let me rephrase that. How heavily impacted are small businesses around our lack of confidence on moving around on the public transport system? Small businesses are facing huge problems at the moment in lack of confidence from their workers. So small businesses are ready to bring people back to their shops and restaurants and et cetera, all of which have reopened. But when you're faced with your, uh, you know, total free staff members all saying, I'm too nervous to get on the tube, um, you, you have to look at how you're going to deal with that. Uh, we do have a moral obligation to the well-being of our staff as well as an economic obligation and a, a desire to grow and uh, uh, recover. Um, so I'd say that on top of the current challenges of the cost of bringing people back to work, the cost of PPE, uh, we figured out that it's about a thousand pounds that a small businesses are having to outlay on becoming um, fulfilling the COVID risk assessments and stuff. So really, just the very short term, this week, last week, there is huge challenges, and that's against the backdrop of huge, bigger picture challenges too. Um, okay, let me quickly move over to Philip. So, Philip, what, are you, what is the mayor doing about increasing confidence in travelling on the tube? We know, for instance, that TfL have great data and could be doing much more around the kind of challenges that Jordan just highlighted. So what is the office specifically doing around increasing um, the capacity of the tube, which is probably a TfL question, but about the confidence of using the network in general? Well, the mayor, the mayor has been has been pushing pushed for some time and about the importance of uh, non-medical face coverings for using public transport as a way of managing, of helping to manage the risks associated with that and bring back confidence. I mean, it's interesting that the government had finally a little while brought that forward. TfL have been doing a huge amount with the data that they have available. I, mean, I appreciate that businesses will always want more, but um, over the course of lockdown, we've, we, TfL has been innovating a lot to be able to use load weight, load weight data and to be able to use rapidly available, not quite real-time data in terms, of, in terms of tube and bus usage to identify where the pinch points are, how patterns of travel have changed during lockdown, and then target particular areas and particular sectors um, in terms of how they work with their how they work with their workers to bring people in, and that's been particularly key over the over over the the, the months up to now with the construction sector, because actually the peak of tube travel shifted from the sort of 7:30 to 9 period for office workers earlier in the day as it as the construction sector continued to need that work, and we've achieved a lot to enable that to know where capacity is needed. And to innate and to work with firms so they understand those peaks to deal with it and we'll continue to do that and tfl will continue to do that as as office workers start return start to return over the coming months and as those patterns change we'll continue to make as we'll try and make as much of that available as we can and meet the aspirations of business but there's a lot of work going on is there any more that can be done around the, the specifics of 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 that feeling of safety, of, of confidence. Um, Rowena made a comment that um, her members' staff are saying we are afraid, we're nervous to get on the tube. The mayor was criticised uh, quite heavily for, for not providing PPE for his own staff. C can, can he do more about su suggesting or telling people how the tube is safe to use? Because that confidence piece goes again to one of Jordan's confidence about, about comments about consumer confidence and, of course, consumer behaviour habits going forward. And our transport system is is pivotal to that. And I'm not hearing enough around what we're going to do specifically to to give people a, a feeling of confidence using the system. What else can be done? Well, we are we are trying to to get the messages across about the safety of the tube as. A, when, and as long as people travel appropriately, um, as much as we can. The tube has never been cleaner than it has before. Staff are trained to support passengers to deal with this. But I don't think you can unpick this issue from the wider health issues. You know, what alongside, um, you know, getting the, getting the message right about travel that both the health side and the transport side can stay with, what will bring confidence to people is getting test and trace right, getting outbreak control right, 
um, ensuring that the government has a system that people really have confidence in so that as as the pattern changes, people know that any anything that occurs will be dealt with appropriately. OK, um, just to, to, to move on to another comment um, from Jordan, it'd be interesting to hear Jordan and Arena's comments around this, around the productivity and skills piece. Um, what, what would you like to see that the mayor do more of? What could the mayor do to support the development of those two concepts, concepts, productivity increasing in the future and also the skills agenda as well? I'll, I'll let you go, Rowena, first. Uh, Jordan, I'm sure you've got some great points, so I'll let you say the main part, but I would just repeat, uh, um, I say at London Assembly Member Bailey, that our, I, I really believe that it is an issue that when there are projects in existence we want small businesses to be able to take them up this idea of the apprenticeship from the 2000 it is not enough we really do need to lobby for some level of match funding to enable london small businesses to employ london people okay interesting thank you i think i'd really uh, i'd mainly echo that apprenticeship starts uh, across london really could be ramped up and i think that the levy has a lot of challenges with it uh, and there have been some innovative solutions and i know that uh, the mayor has been working on that across some boroughs, but also uh, things like construction skills academies that we've seen across some boroughs can be rolled out to different types of industries. So construction is obviously a big anchor industry for London, uh, but as we've highlighted today, there's more than one real anchor industry for London. So uh, getting those kind of borough level skills um, academies up specifically to channel people into the jobs that we're going to need. So I'm thinking energy efficiency, retrofit, we can create jobs really quickly in those areas. But the skill sets aren't quite there yet, but they are transferable. So you become an energy retrofitter now and you could potentially become an engineer later on. Um, at the heart of all of this, I would say, Councillor Bailey, is the quality of careers advice, which is perhaps a separate point. A separate point. Um, but I think that uh, those kind of those borough level academies that really target things that we know are going to grow uh, would be where, where we would want to see investment for. So, so j just to go to Philip. Jordan's just talked about specific skill sets and, and Rowena's talked about a match funding. Is that is that on the mayor's agenda? Could you could you commit to the mayor to, to match funding the two thousand pounds for the for the apprenticeship schemes? Is is that something that you could do? And how we roll out how we roll out apprenticeships more fully, how we improve careers advice. The mayor has been arguing for some time for a London careers service that can deliver deliver bespoke advice for that relates to what young people in London need and how we pick up retrofit and energy efficiency and build them into the recovery program and ensure that we get that synergy between something that's going to deliver for our climate objectives, but also is a real spur to job creation, including potentially through the kind of academy that Jordan is talking about, is absolutely something that we're looking at very hard. But but some, sometimes we hear so much from the mayor's office about what everybody else could be doing, the government, et cetera. What, what can the mayor do? For instance, the Good Growth Fund has completed three projects and created 109 jobs. We were initially told it was going to create 6,000 jobs with 83 projects. What, what's, what's happened there? Why, why hasn't the mayor been able to drive that forward? The Good Growth Fund is delivering a, a huge amount of benefit across, across London. One of the things that we are working very hard on at the moment is to make sure that those projects that, we, that, that have been funded that way are stabilised. I mean, almost every project has been affected directly by the impacts of COVID-19. And, and one of the key tasks for my team is to make sure that that programme continues. So the employment benefits and the other benefits that are going to come from that, including around sort of revitalising our high streets, are secured. So the Good Growth Fund is a really important part of this. It, is a, it, it may well be an important part of it, but let's be clear, it's only done three of 83 projects and the COVID situation is relatively new when you compare it to the Good Growth Fund. The reason I ask the question is, before COVID happened, the Good Growth Fund wasn't performing. Now we really need it to perform. Are you redoubling your efforts? Is something different going to be done in this real time of need? Thank you. There's, there's a huge number of good growth projects that are that are that are going on at the moment. I mean, there may be three that are fully completed, if I if I understand correctly. But the you know, work is in hand across London to deliver projects funded through the Good Growth Fund. And indeed, the mayor has just announced a further sort of equivalent fund for the Royal Docks area, another 13 million pounds. Um, so yes, if efforts are redoubling and we are and we are continuing to work with the boroughs to make sure that the benefits of those projects are felt as widely as possible 
Okay, thank you. This will be my last question, Chair, and, and then going to your next person. On the 17th of June, the Economics Committee, the Deputy Mayor for Business indicated that a the creation of an economic recovery strategy for London was a top priority. What progress has been made on this? Um, this is exactly the strategy that's being developed through the economic recovery working group that Councillor Gould is chairing and the work that's the work that's going on through through the task force. So uh, we are we are developing that strategy as a joint project between the GLA and the boroughs and L London councils. Not quite as we speak, because I'm sitting in this this assembly room, but right now. Um, Councillor Gould, maybe you could tell us where, where you got to with that. Do, do we have a delivery date and um, terms of reference? Any, any information would be greatly received. Yes, yeah, so we'll be presenting to the recovery board on Tuesday um, the, the missions that we plan to take forward, and they incorporate so much of what's been put forward in this conversation. So, for example, I think the, the point about skills academies for, um, for green jobs is absolutely um, in there. We are looking to increase the number of green jobs. We think retrofitting is a huge opportunity for London, green investment, revitalising our high streets. And we've had working groups already of, of borough offices and the GLA getting this work on the ground. We're seeing it in all of our boroughs in terms of new cycle um, and pedestrian routes. Um, new licensing to, to support uh, businesses in the short term, the investment we've seen through the, um, the growth fund um, and the support to businesses. So that you know we haven't waited. The, the work is ongoing, but we'll be um, launching um, our kind of our, our missions, our, our call to action um, to, to London, um, or, or presenting it to the recovery board and, and hoping that that support is taken forward. But um, that the work like, um, is. I've never known um, uh, the GLA and Boroughs to be working more closely together, and we we really, you know, we're seeing the needs um, in our communities as it is, um, and those those kind of key focus for us is is unemployment, um, retraining, uh, supporting uh, a green led recovery, supporting our our high streets across the capital, and uh, at the same time the, the central activity zone. So, um, yeah, so it'll be uh, going forward on, on Tuesday. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Assembly Member. Uh... Uh, Bailey, Jess uh, Tyrrell has uh, indicated. Do you want to hear or you want to move on? I do. I do want to hear. Yeah. Uh, yeah thank please. you. And um, just to echo the point, I mean, the West End will not survive this if we carry on the way we are. I think a lot of the points have been made at the moment that, you know, yeah. one in 10 Londoners are employed in the West End across retail, theatre, hospitality, the office sector. It's more GBA than cities. It's stuff assembly members are aware of. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to move beyond. Uh, obviously, the government support and actually what we need to think about is, is how do we get beyond social distancing being the default position? You know, we could be living with this virus for 18 months, two years. So really good track and trace, excellent treatments and obviously a vaccine. And that is really going to start to help people get back to work and back to the West End. And I think, you know, we're looking at a really precarious situation in the West End at the moment. We could be losing 50,000 jobs in the next 12 months and stuff that you've seen and the issues we've spoken about. So this is an issue for London, you know, this is an issue for the country in terms of what's happening in the West End at the moment. I think to pick up the point on transport, and I know it's been raised by other colleagues, this confidence and consistency of message is really important. You know, we've looked at some other cities around the world that have opened up for the same amount of time uh, that London's been opening up. And they're getting to sort of 40, 50 percent on their networks with social distancing in place. So I think perhaps the task of the mayor and TfL is how can we increase the capacity with social distancing in place to get more people into the centre of London? And we can't wait two or three months. We need to start getting people in now uh, as well. So I think really back to the mayor and TfL to work with, with colleagues, particularly in central London, to make that happen. And I think, just if I may, touch on a couple of sort of medium-term points. Um, as you think about Brexit and the EU deal that was raised earlier, one thing that will really help the West End and also London with the visitor economy is tax-free shopping. At the moment, on the 1st of January, we uh, will be able to go to Europe and shop tax-free, but European citizens, 500 million of them, won't be able to come to the UK. So we need to level that up because that is going to have a huge demand for our visitor economy, and that, that will also support many jobs and many people across hospitality, retail, culture. So there's one ask, it's for the government to level up tax-free so we can actually get those 500 million European visitors over to the UK uh, from the 1st of January next year. Thank you. Right, Assembly Member Bailey, are you 
finished now with your questioning? Yes, Chair. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, that, that brings an uh, end to the supplementary lead questions. Let's move on to uh, supplementary questions from uh, uh, members. Uh, can we start with uh, Assembly Member Caroline Pigeon, please? very much, Chair. Um, London's markets are part of our history and add to the vibrance and cultural diversity of our city, as well as being a significant part of the economy, particularly in areas like the East End. I wrote to the Deputy Mayor for Business just last week with concerns market traders have over their future in many parts of London. So first of all, my question to Councillor Gould, as you're a board member of um, the LEAP and with your work on the Recovery Task Force. I'm aware money has been made available to small businesses, including market traders, um, through funds such as the Local Authority Discretionary Fund. But do you share my concern over reports that in some parts of London, market traders are being offered as little as £360 to compensate them for loss of income during the pandemic? I, I absolutely share that concern and I think that we just don't have enough money in the discretionary funding pots we've been given. So to, uh, in Camden, we, we have Camden Market and I know I have emails every single day from Camden Market traders who um, are in danger of, of losing their businesses and they, they're seeing the discretionary fund as, as their kind of last chance. But we, Camden have had 1,500 applications for that fund and we think we were able to fund 350. There's just not enough money, and a lot of a lot of um, market traders, but also um, uh, businesses and co-working spaces um, who don't pay business rates, and and um, live music venues have just been left out of that money. So it's something that we're very firmly lobbying on because if we got more discretionary funding um, uh, in order to kind of top up that pot, we'd be able to give money um, to to those um, to those market traders and, and to those other businesses. We have a very clear picture of the need, um, but we just haven't been. Um, given enough money for those for those different businesses who who fall out um, of the pot. I think most boroughs, including my own, have given um, uh, uh, free space to market traders and supported them how we can, but we do need that discretionary funding. And what conversations has the LEAP been having with the mayor and his team, and maybe even government, over how markets and market traders in particular can be supported, not just now, but also in the weeks and the months ahead? So I'm, I'm not aware of the, the specific conversations the leak have been having, but I know that um, in our economic recovery um, work, markets and high streets are absolutely at the heart of it. And one of our key work streams is reinvigorating our high streets and our markets and seeing them as, as core, not just to the economic recovery of London, but also the social recovery of London. So um, that's, that's partly lobbying, but that's also kind of working together on, on a borough level to support um, walking um, and, and cycling to... Um, to support kind of different uses um, of, of public spaces. And, and that work is, is happening, and you can see it happening um, uh, across our boroughs as we speak. Lovely. Thank you for that. And uh, we all know that boroughs face unprecedented financial uncertainty and strain as a result of the pandemic and following five years of deep government cuts to local government. I wanted to ask um, Rowena um, from the Federation of Small Businesses, what more do you and me your members think the Mayor of London and indeed government could do to support market traders, other sole traders and micro businesses more generally in both the short term and also the longer term as we move forward out of this crisis? Um, if I just touch upon the cost of doing business in London and uh, the, the the nature of commercial space and the cost of that in the in London too, um, I think we're, we've been looking hard at landlord um, tenant relationships and we've asked the mayor for support in uh, trying to navigate more difficult relationships where landlords are not willing or not able to give any leeway to tenants um, in terms of uh, rent that is at this point unpaid. There was a lot done um, at the beginning of the pandemic in March where maybe a rent-free quarter was asked for and maybe granted. The, the impact has been longer and deeper, of course, and we're getting into a situation where those rent-free periods have perhaps ended. We're getting to a point where uh, fixed overheads just 
can't be paid at this point. And that is the same for maybe a market trader as it is for a small business in an office or a restaurant or a shop or whatever. So it's really broadly across all our members that the, uh, the nature of the cost of the space is something that people are finding it very difficult to, to maintain. Now, how you solve that is a very difficult question, but one, we've been running a cam campaign called London Landlords Listen, We've really been trying to look at the moral obligation of uh, landlords. Um, and what really helped at the beginning was when some of the big landlords took uh, a step and they were the ones that led the way. We need that to happen again. And we are asking the mayor to work with us to try and get some of the bigger landlords to lead the way on new ways forward um, on how we can make affordable space in London. So, yeah, the changing nature of commercial space and, and the usage of it I'm as well. I'm sorry, but... That's uh, where the Mayor and London Councils can come in and help. Lovely. Thank you very much. I'm out of time. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, before I bring in uh, uh, the next Assembly member, uh, may I please uh, plead uh, to our guests to be very succinct because we want to have benefit of uh, hearing... Uh, from as many guests as possible. So could you please be very, very succinct in your response so that assembly members can bring in other guests as well. Uh, can we move on to question from uh, assembly member Devonish? Thank you very much. Chair, I'll be very succinct. Two questions and I'll put them to Jace Tyrrell and others can come in when they get called by other assembly members. So Jace, could you please just Give us an update on where we are on business rates and what we need the government to do. That's my first question. And secondly, would you agree with me the biggest concern is that the lost generation are the teens and early 20s that aren't already in work. What can business, let's not always say what can government, what can business do to help those people get work experience? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Assembly Member Devonish. Um, on rates, I'm sure everyone's seen the announcement by the government this week that actually looking at valuations now post-COVID and delaying the sort of fundamental review until 23. I mean, we know, for example, there are hundreds of businesses, even pre-COVID in the West End, that were looking to move or decrease their retail portfolio because of the business rate. So for a long time, we know this is a broken tax that falls disproportionately on the retail sector but also is a sort of, you know, 200 year tax that isn't fit for the purpose of where we are today. I think what we need is something for bridging from next year. So from the 1st of April, the holiday will end. If we go back to what we were pre-COVID, no holiday, we're going to see hundreds, if not thousands of businesses collapse in London. So what we need the government to do is put something in place between the 1st of April next year and 2023 don't know what the answer to that is yet, but certainly to give confidence now that they're going to look at something to bridge that two years. Because decisions will be made this September and October on whether they close their stores and the redundancies that follow. So really urge the government to come up with something transitional for those two years and welcome the commitment to fundamental reform. We'd like to see more of the rates actually back to London as well. I mean, we pay £1 billion in our three streets alone in the West End. 4% comes back to Westminster very little to the GLA, so we've got to rethink about how that distribution works for the productivity and the future of London and the UK. Um, on the jobs, uh, you're quite right, and I think uh, Assemblymember Russell raised this before, particularly in retail, hospitality and leisure, and again, one in ten Londoners are employed in the West End, this pandemic and the job losses falls very hard on those entry-level jobs, uh, particularly female and young people as well, so this is a real acute concern for a lot of our members and employees in the West End. I think Microsoft have got some very good work they're looking at on productivity and reskilling, particularly in the retail sector. And I think if we could actually roll that up as something more London-wide on the skills agenda, uh, thinking how we can use some of that money raised in the apprenticeship levy and other sources on reskilling, particularly in retail and hospitality, that's going to really help us in the medium term as well. Thank you for being so concise. Could you write to us? I'd like to take your latter point up with Jules Pipe, the Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Can we move on to Assembly member, member Buff, please? Assembly member Buff. An indicator, Chair. Yeah, can you speak, please? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we can see you. An indicator. You're on the list here. I've been given oh, a list of members who've indicated before. 
so I'm going okay. by the running Sorry, list I've been mistake. given. That was a mistake. I might come in later, but I have not. Okay, no problem at all. Uh, in that case, uh, can I move on to Assemblymember Cooper, please? Your question. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, my question is addressed to um, Councillor Georgia Gould, um, and it concerns disproportionality in the economic recovery. Um, and I just wondered if you could outline for us um, how uh, you're working with the Mayor to guarantee that London's economic recovery is fair and open for all Londoners, especially those who've been really disproportionately impacted by COVID. Yeah, thank you for that question. And, and I think that this um, crisis, as I said at the start, has shone a light on the inequalities in our city. And particularly, um, we've seen the health impact um, on our Black, Asian and minority communities. And that's linked to a number of factors, including housing overcrowding, um, and, um, but also the, the kind of jobs that, that, that people do. So in, in terms of um, how we're focused on it, I think the, we, we see the, a key risk to, um, to unemployment for Londoners um, in poorer parts of the city, on low pay, um, and um, particularly um, our Black Asian minority communities, and so we are. So when we're looking at um, trying to prevent unemployment, we will be kind of focusing those programmes and that support, that retraining on on the most disadvantaged um, Londoners. Um, we are also, as, as I said, have a real focus on digital access, which again I think is is, is very linked to to deprivation um, and and focusing um, that that resource and that support on, on disadvantaged Londoners. Um, and I know that the mayor has a number of schemes to support diversity in in different sectors, um, and those will will continue and will be kind of put um, uh, kind of addressing that in in the business support. Uh, as we move forward, but there's there's definitely links to the social recovery work stream, um, and we're working very closely. And one, some of their kind of key support will will be around addressing some of the health inequalities. Um, and we haven't talked about test and trace, but ensuring that we're getting um, the testing and right messages um, to to Londoners who are at most at risk, and working on prevention in areas of, of the city that we we think we might see a, a spread of COVID. Yeah, I think, uh, thank you very much for that. I think one of the issues that's going to start to emerge now, looking slightly ahead, is, for example, as the furlough scheme starts to wind down. And I think, obviously, I mean, you talked about young Londoners, particularly in answer to Assemblymember Russell, but I think both um, black and minority ethnic Londoners, as well as young Londoners in general, are most likely to have been working in jobs that couldn't be done from home. Um, many of them may already have been made redundant, but those that have been furloughed, I think as the furlough scheme starts to wind up, may now be in danger of um, actually being just made redundant. And I think that's a great, great worry from August onwards. Um, would you agree that some kind of targeted peer support programmes might be able to um, play a role in supporting London's diverse communities? Because I, I, I do worry that some of the initiatives are not necessarily getting out to the people that need them most? Yeah, I, I think in terms of um, what we should be doing, I think it's two, twofold, ensuring that there's rapid retraining and, and skilling for growth sectors or, or jobs that we are helping to create, like, like we talked about retrofitting and the green economy. And I think investing in those areas and creating um, sustainable jobs in those areas and, and skills academies to support them um, is part of it and ensuring that uh, diverse Londoners are getting those opportunities. But also the, um, uh, the DWP is working to um, uh, any extension of a health work and health pilot or, or other schemes to help those others from the labour market. Um, that the money is flexible in London and goes to boroughs because we have the relationships um, with our communities. Um, we, you know, we that people are often our tenants. We're working with them um, through through other services, um, food distribution, and so on. And we can we can have that kind of peer peer support localised community support to get people into work. In Camden, we invested five million, for example, into that. But often we, we see schemes that, that are kind of centrally imposed. So we're really pushing for um, place-based, localised support for, for Londoners who are furthest for, from the labour market as, as part of our wider lobbying asks. Th th thanks very much for that. And I think that's absolutely right to add that point about local authorities. And it's certainly been very impressive the way that the mayor and his team have been working so closely with um, London councils as a whole. So, so thank you for that. Thank you, Chair. And that's the end of my questions. Right. Uh, can, can, I, can I suggest uh, to our uh, Assembly member colleagues that uh, 
whilst you asking the question, if you see any hand going up from any other guests, if you do want to ask questions, can you please, please uh, ask uh, those guests to, to then answer the question so that you, know, uh, you, you have an opportunity uh, to get uh, more information from uh, any of our guests. So ju just uh, uh, to be on the lookout for uh, anybody else wanting to contribute <coughs> from our panel of guests. Uh, can, can we move on to a question from Assembly Member Sahota, please? Uh, good morning. Uh, this question is uh, to Jordan from the CBI. In eight days' time, employers will be, will be made to pay the national insurance contributions and pension contributions for workers that have been furloughed. And in September, employers will be expected to start topping up the furloughed workers' wages. What impact do you think this will have on sectors of the economy that have not yet been able to open up and generate income? Uh, thank you very much. I think it could uh, potentially have a, a serious impact. It's, it's really difficult. We're in a quite a lot of conversations with sectors at the moment about what kind of modelling capacity they have internally, about where their workforce goes. Um, there's a disparity between people who are already on a transformation programme who've just sped it up and people who have introduced a transformation programme because of COVID and have then had to speed that up too. So I think really understanding where, industry are, where industries are as a whole is very, very difficult. Um, there are of course, a lot of ongoing discussions with the Treasury uh, and business, including ourselves, about the future of the furlough scheme, wage subsidies, all of these things that have been thrown around, uh, looking at our international comparators. Uh, it's, uh, they're not always one-size-fits-all solutions. Are we? Yeah, similarly, we'll the sound. Uh, Chair, I, I lost the sound. Yeah, yeah, so have we... We've all lost the sound. Can... Uh, I think... I think he's completely frozen. Can yeah. our broadcast team look into this, please? The else is fine, Chair. Looks like it's just he's frozen on his end. Right. Right. Okay. Um, then maybe we can move on. Shall we move on to the next person? Next person I want to move the chair to? Well, yes, happy to if you've completed. Okay. Let's, yeah. can, I, can I go over to, over to the TUC, please? Uh, the representative from the TUC. Um, the, the government has, has introduced elements of flexibility in the furlough scheme, which allows employers to bring forward uh, their workers back into after the furlough. But of course, uh, not all, everyone will be able to, go, able to go back to work on the 1st of August. So is there any, any average work you're doing for people who feel unable to return to work after furlough on the 1st of August? Thanks, yes. So it's a, it's a key question. We've been pushing very hard in discussions with the government on more flexibility on the furlough scheme. So we welcomed some of the changes which were made to allow people to come back uh, in, in blocks and sections. There is going to be a crucial issue around continued support for people who are shielding or have members of their family who are still shielding. We have a report coming out on that uh, either tomorrow or early next week. Um, this relates back to other points which colleagues have made around the furlough scheme needing to continue or a form of a furlough scheme needing to continue for sectors who are going to find it much harder uh, to move into a transition and recovery phase as well so a lot of work going on on that in terms of support we, we i was trying to come in on the creative um, and leisure sector stuff obviously there um, but other other sectors where we know people uh, are not going to be able to come back as soon so so two issues there one continued support for people who've got um, shielding responsibilities or are shielding and what happens there. Um, we have an issue report coming out as well on, on uh, impact on disabled workers and this particular impact on those and making sure that there is still support for those people. Um, lots of people still have childcare issues uh, with obviously the summer holidays, but with schools still being closed, with early years centres still being closed, and there is support needed for those people as well. So there are a range of things where we've been in discussion with the government. I say there's been some progress, but not enough. Um, I would, Chair, if I could just say, I was trying to um, indicate on, on Leone's one as well, I realise there isn't time for me to come back on, on lots of those points, but as the one union person here, I would draw... Um, all Assembly members' attention to the London Recovery Report, which we put out, which contains points on just about every question which has been asked so far, um, and also to a series of specific reports, which are all on the TC website, and we can endeavour to make sure that you're sent to them uh, on things like we released Dying on the Job, which is our report on the disproportionate impact on BAME workers last week, 
uh, several reports on the disproportionate impact on women uh, and on mothers in particular, but, but on women in, for a number of different reasons. And as I say, work we've been doing on disabled workers and the disproportionate impact of COVID. So that's all out there, but it, it does very much relate back to that point on, on targeted support uh, from a furlough scheme and the need for ongoing support as well. Okay, so Sam, just a very short one. I, I've heard that some Londoners have said that whilst they are, whilst they're still furloughed, uh, and doing full-time work, some employers are only giving them 80% of their salaries. So some employers are abusing their staff. Is the TUC doing anything about that? So when we secured the 80% um, and the support for self-employed people, which we were very involved along with many of the business organisations who are on this call at the beginning, um, obviously what we were hoping there was a request was to companies who could financially do it to, to make up the rest of people's pay. And a number of companies have done that. Uh, public sector have done that. Do you see, for instance, we've done that for our furloughed staff. It's not been possible to be known for all businesses. People are under extreme pressure at the moment. And the idea was to keep as many people in employment as was possible um, during the heart of a pandemic. Uh, we've been particularly worried by the reports that have been coming through of people abusing the furlough scheme, where they've been putting people onto furlough and then asking them to work. And there are issues around that which need to be looked at quite closely. Um, so there have been abuses which need to be looked at. Um, as I say, we've been trying to encourage companies uh, to actually make up the pay where possible. Um, one of the issues that we found is that in London, there are a disproportionate number of people who are particularly concerned about the debt which they've gone into during the crisis. So even people who are on furlough, some costs have gone down for people. But obviously, when you look at our rent, uh, our other costs at the moment, which haven't gone down for people who have been furloughed, obviously, if you lose 20% of your income and you're on very low pay to begin with, that is a particular problem. Um, and we know that we've got a disproportionately large number of people in the capital who are in insecure work, on low paid work, I mean, even of key workers in the capital. We've got 800,000 key workers, 30% of whom are on under £10 an hour at the moment. And if you imagine those are people who've been working full time during this crisis, but are still under massive economic pressure. Uh, well, Sam, look, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm out of time, right? But I, I would love to have a good come up with a follow-up. But look, thank you very much for highlighting this issue. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from uh, Assembly Member McCartney, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. My initial question is to Sam Gurney, if I can. And it's about the increasing numbers of people who are claiming universal credit, which we know is a very difficult and cruel system. Um, since the end of March, I believe, um, 440,000 new claimants for universal credit have come from um, London. And obviously, when furlough ends, that is likely to see another spike. Um, can I say, what concerns does the TUC have about this record number of Londoners finding themselves reliant on universal credit? And what will that mean for poverty in the capital? Thanks, yeah. I mean, the issue of our broken safety net was was a massive one before the crisis. But as you say, what's happened now is just a huge additional strain has been put on that system. And literally hundreds of thousands of people who probably haven't had to come into contact with the system before have now woken up to the fact that you cannot live on, on the level of support which is available for most people under UC. Um, so there are, there are I said, huge issues before. The TUC Welfare Charter... Um, and policy on kind of you know, a, a universal reform of that system, basically, um, which is needed. We host in our region uh, an organisation called London Unemployed Strategies, which is a claimant support group, which has claimants uh, rights groups in a number of London boroughs. Um, and I, I chair that. So I get kind of monthly just for kind of, you know, for day to day experience of colleagues, of people kind of, of unemployed workers coming in on kind of what's been happening in the system. Now, there are some potential positives. We're seeing the government talking about potentially reopening. Um, uh, job centres across London which have been closed or across the country which have been closed so there is a possibility that we might have uh, an increase in provision there there were some immediate things which were done in terms of waiting period um, and enabling people to put claims in without having to have interviews and stuff so there were, there were a couple of kind of tweaks if you like to a, to a very defective system which kind of have helped in the short term but essentially yeah, we have a we have a system which is not fit for purpose which doesn't have money in it to actually provide the support that's needed and I say what, what happened was we had the furlough scheme and the self-employed scheme for, for rightly for hundreds of thousands of workers, but we had a lot of people who, who fell outside of that for various reasons, weren't eligible because they'd moved jobs just before that came in uh, and have had to fall back on, on the universal credit system and, have, I said, realised 
just how inadequate it is. So we're really hoping to see some substantial changes on that. It needs, yeah, it needs reform. That's a national issue. Um, but at a London level, we've seen some quite impressive stuff uh, in terms of things like recourse for people who, I'm um, sorry, people who don't have the right to access support. And the mayor actually saying all of the right things on that, and we need to build on that. Um, and we need to build on the support that's available for most people in the capital. Thank you. My next question is to Georgia um, Gould. And I'm sure that um, you know, you're concerned about residents who haven't applied for universal credit and the difficult issues associated with that scheme. But obviously, there is a whole swathe of Londoners who have no recourse to public funds, who have been made or are at real risk of destitution. Um, the mayor has written to the prime minister calling on the government to support those who have no recourse to public funds and to end the five-week wait for universal um, credit. Um, can I ask what London Council's take is on these issues and what impact particularly it is having on local authorities and what you would like to see the government do about this? Yeah, I think it's an incredibly important um, question and it the biggest impact we're seeing is is in relation to homelessness. We we were asked as local authorities to to act quickly to to take people off the street, which was absolutely the right thing to do given the huge risk um, that that um, uh, our, our people on the street faced around COVID and already poor health outcomes. And we've done that uh, across the capital, and thousands of people have have been in hotels um, and and other provision and, and supported, but. But large numbers of those do have no recourse to public funds, and we as councils are supporting them. We have real concerns whether we will get the, the funding to 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 um, for, for the money we've paid out or for the long term to support those individuals um, in, in, into long term housing. It's a it's a massive gap, and and people are in a desperate situation. And you know, it it we have a once in a generation um, opportunity, I think, to address um, homelessness here. It, you know, it shouldn't have taken the pandemic to take this kind of drastic action. To, you know, this has been an ongoing issue that we've not just been campaigning on through COVID, but for years we've known that there are people on our streets who just fall between the cracks of, of any service. Um, and this and this has to be the moment that we that we properly address it, that we support those individuals um, into long term services, whether they're you know a risk of domestic abuse, a risk of destitution, need employment support. Um, and and we we absolutely um, support that call, um, and it's 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 a big kind of resource um, for us as as councils, and we are making that resource for the time being. But you know we're all facing huge financial um, uh, holes, so so we need government to, to step in. Um, and the final question I have, and I'll keep it to you, Georgia, if I may, is that I think councils, community organisations, and the mayor's office really stepped up. Um, with regards to um, food insecurity throughout this crisis. We already had very high levels of food insecurity and it's just been made so much worse. But obviously with the economic downturn um, and the recovery going to be very long and hard, there will be more Londoners pushed into poverty, particularly concerned about increasing child poverty. What do we need to see the mayor and government do to make sure that we protect those at risk of food insecurity? Yeah, again, um, the pandemic has gone by on a long-term systemic issue of, of food poverty. Um, and, and the kind of, it's been an extraordinary mobilisation um, across London and boroughs. So in, in Camden, we've delivered 100,000 meals through the pandemic to people who were shielding, but also to people who are in food poverty. And we have um, now, um, the government has committed to support um, uh, the, this summer holidays, which is is very welcome, but that it can't. You know, food, we have been worried about holiday hunger for years, and the mayor has been supporting projects across the capital around holiday hunger, um, around breakfast clubs for years. But it, but you know, the, the funding needs to be more systemic um, and needs to, to 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 ensure that every child on free school meals has food over over the holidays, and that shouldn't just be a this summer commitment. This has to be. A long-term commitment. I think that the coalitions that we built around food poverty um, and and that mobilisation uh, needs to continue. And there, there's been re real progress around food waste and, and distributing food, new networks. But it can't. We that that has been kind of funded up to now. But if we can continue that, I think we can make real progress in 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 um, addressing food poverty and and the signal that food poverty gives of wider income challenges. Because when a family or an individual is in food poverty. 
that, that when you when you go and support that individual, there's often issues of debt, in work poverty, 60% of, of Londoners who are um, uh, in poverty and working households. So it kind of, um, there, there are kind of systemic issues we need to address that food poverty shows, but, but no Londoners should, should be hungry. And that should be, a, I think, a goal for all of us in London to take forward. Indeed, I couldn't agree more. Thank you, Chair. Right. Uh, can we now have a question from uh, Assembly Member Gavran? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, I, panel, good morning. I, um, I've, I've seen that we've had quite a lot of questions on the um, arts and creative sectors, but I just want to drill down now because this morning the, the um, Select Committee on Arts and Culture published its report on just what we, some of what we've been drilling down on. So perhaps if I could, I'd like to ask a number of you to think about this question, but perhaps if I could start with Sam Gurney from the TUC. And good morning, Sam. Uh, we know that the, um, the income, the self-employment income support scheme is only available if you work if you get more than mo half, more than half your income from it, and shockingly, that does exclude an enormous number of freelancers, and particularly in the creative industries, because what they have to do is to actually supplement their income, if they can, with income from PAYE short-term contracts, backstage, front of house at the bars, in the bars, working in the bars. And this income is not eligible for any income support either. So, so many freelancers who work in the arts and creative industries are just not getting any income at all. We know that one in three performance artists have no income at the moment, none. So the question really is, what we know we, perhaps we're going to hear some answers from this select committee report and none of us have had time to read it but what actually would you recommend that we do about this and if we could get a range of views and just pin it down starting with Sam thanks Nikki I mean you, you've identified like the absolute crucial problem and as we comes back to a UC question before around people who had to fall back on, on other support systems which are inadequate. So I'm, I'm not an expert on this and I haven't had a look at the thing, but the people who are, Equity, Resistance Union, Back to Prospect, for unions who are representing colleagues in this sector who've been working with the Creative Industries uh, Federation as well on kind of looking at what should happen on this. So Tony Lennon, who's our regional president, um, has been doing a huge amount of work during the pandemic on supporting their freelance members um, on, on just day-to-day -day support, basically. So there's a, there's a lot of expertise out there and a lot of that's being put in at the national level. So I think what I have to undertake is, is to look at that in terms of the concrete proposals. The key things that colleagues have been saying to us in terms of the kind of policy stuff like this is the support that's out there, this is, I would have come back in on that, that earlier question. We need systems that get it to the individuals, so that either gets it to the individuals who've, who've lost income or gets it to... Uh, the, the smaller companies, the micro businesses that Rona was talking about, which are you know, small enterprises. So, making sure that the funding which is being made available at the moment doesn't just go automatically to the big institutions, but has some system that makes sure that it cascades down to the staff. So, we keep some of our expertise that people can stay in the industry and we don't lose it. And people have found some amazing ways of evolving. Um, and operating during the pandemic, moving stuff online, um, you know, some really innovative kind of local performance stuff. I'm in Waltham Forest. We've had huge amounts of kind of cultural stuff online during the pandemic, um, which has kept people kind of, you know, with at least some income coming in. Um, so what I'd say there is, is yeah, talk to the unions who've got the expertise on the ground. We'll make sure they're plugged into it. Funny enough, I've got a call directly after this meeting with Amy Lamy, um uh, from City Hall on exactly this, on making sure that they're plugged in to all of the right union colleagues on these issues. That's very helpful, thank you. Would um, John Dickey, would you like to come in on this? Very happy to chat. Can I make just perhaps two or three points about the cultural sector? Many, we've had much discussion about it already. I, I think the first is the importance of getting tourism back to the cultural sector as well as to retail cannot be underestimated. And that requires a series of actions by, I think, government and by London. By government, we need 
Can I, just, can I just come in for a minute on that? I'm so pleased you mentioned that because I think it's not properly understood that tourism is really, in a sense, a byproduct of, well, our wonderful heritage and built environment, but particularly of the arts and creative industries. I mean, they are the. Uh, they uh, are. In, 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 indeed. And uh, the, the sort of two things I think that can be most usefully done uh, in the short term are firstly, uh, government putting in place much clearer policies around how tourists can visit the UK. So what are the rules about air bridges? When, when, when can another airport fly into London or not? When will that change? How will that work? Of course, that would give a lot of confidence to people in other countries and indeed in the UK going out as to, as to how they can plan for their travel. I think the other thing is around transport in London. And we've touched on this earlier, but, but let me just reiterate it. But the points we made that we need people to be to feel safe about going onto the tube and for the tube to be safe but they also need to want to go onto the tube and one of the things that will have that full factor is the return of leisure of culture of, of all those facilities in, in central london and we do need to remember that at the moment as of now there is oodles of spare capacity on the underground if you get on the underground okay. outside of peak times there is John, a bit of space you. Thank you. So I want to... Positive messaging. Okay, good. Thank you. I want to get contributions from some of the other panel members, because I just want, you know, just responses to this. Should, you know, what should the targeted support be for this enormous number of freelancers? What can we do? Rowena. Rowena. Just could you... Mute. <laughs> I'm mute. No, she's not. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um... Uh, it's as I said before, I mean, um, there are a huge number of self-employed people working within this industry. There's also a huge number of micro and small businesses working within this industry. Um, there has been some support so far, but it isn't enough, is what I think everyone would agree. Uh, but on the flip side, I'm not going to talk about the money. I am going to talk on things that John Dickey and others have just mentioned. It is about raising confidence. It is about getting people back into central London. It is about getting people on the tube uh, returning in. Um, I mean, the London and Partners, because I'm a London campaign, and many others, and those kind of things are happening in local, na local neighbourhoods as well. Um, social media is helping with that, but there needs to be there needs to be more in terms of raising confidence. I would say, and that's what's going to help small businesses, micro businesses, freelancers, etc. Okay, so the context is really important. I get it. Okay, absolutely. And Richard Burgess may have more to say too, uh, London Chamber of Commerce. Yes, could you say something? Yeah, uh, just to, to add uh, two things. One is it is about confidence and it's also about international confidence as well. We've got to start getting the message out internationally that London is open and we've got to make that language and that dialogue much more about what we can do than what we can't do. Um, the second thing I'd just like to say on the creative industries, which is something which I do worry about. Before all this happened, there was a huge problem already in the creative industries of it becoming a middle class profession because of the way in which uh, young people can get access to grants for training. It's basically driving out from our drama schools and, and, and other places for technical training, people who did not have the resources of a family to back them up. And I think this is just going to make it worse. It's going to drive out more and more, you know, uh, much more we're going to end up with a less diverse creative industry background both on front both on the stage and behind it as well and i think find some way of addressing that yes, sorry it's so short a time but if i had more time i would ask you georgia what the the um the recovery working group's doing on on this because i i can see us risking the next generation of of creative talent especially from bame and communities and people with disabilities and people on low income. So your point is really well made, but I think I'm probably out of time. I'm sorry not to be able to go across the whole panel, but thank you very much for, that, for those answers. Assembly member Dismore, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Georgia, uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, PPE supply because the fragility of the PPE supply chain has been under scrutiny throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. And finally, after weeks of weeks of dragging their feet in mixed messages, the government's made face coverings mandatory in shops as of tomorrow. So how, in this context, how can our post-COVID economy build in better resilience for essential supplies like PPE? Yeah, I think that um, 
it, it's welcome that there's clear guidance on on shops and and its face coverings and i think people are, are being asked to, to use face coverings and and not kind of and not like the, the kind of ppe we would use for um uh, care homes or or those kind of settings but um i i, I think that try, the the issue has was a as a centralized scheme that was often slow to to get vital supplies to to local places um and i think you know obviously we will do all we can to prevent a second wave um but we need we need to you know be preparing for it in case it does happen and and we cannot see the the same um uh, slowness and and lack of supplies we did last time around so i think that there's a real kind of ask for, for, from us as, as local places for government to work alongside us around ppe supplies around food distribution to support localized networks um and you know we in in my borough, I think we we gave out 400,000 pieces of PPE to um, local public sector care bodies, um, other organisations. So we have those networks in place, um, but we need to make sure that that supply is 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 coming in and that we can be really confident, um, and not just two days supply that we were getting um, often, but but long term supply. And so um, we yeah we we we're very much pushing for for, for that to be the case um, in in the event of any kind of um, second wave. Okay, thanks. And Rosina, uh, for the FSB, according to the London Health Board's review of the pandemic, staff in care homes or in home care settings were working without PPE and often, often without knowledge as to whether they, either they or their clients were infectious. And despite this situation, British companies couldn't find a way into the government supply chain. And meanwhile, an investigation by The Guardian suggests that the Chinese government may have influenced an NHS supplier to prioritise clients in China over our NHS. Would you agree that bringing in local supplies into public procurement could help improve this resilience? I definitely think that uh, procurement is something that we have been working with the mayor on to improve access for small businesses in every single regard. And, uh, uh, and I think you're right, none, none more than the provision of a very urgent thing such as PPE over the last uh, couple of months. Um, we've been seeking further clarity historically over the last few months, as well as issues of procurement, because what was feeding into the procurement problem was the lack of clarity. We're still seeking more on that. Um, uh, but I think I would also like to point out that um, there's been a couple of mentions towards um, helping black businesses um, access, uh, 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 have, have further access. Uh, the Federation of Small Business brought out a report in the last week, um, and one of the things that it highlighted was issues of access um, for procurement for black businesses in particular. So, um, yeah, yes, I would certainly say that there are many small businesses here in Britain who are here and ready to help, and um, access is a real issue. Well, thanks a lot. And, and Sam, could I uh, come to you? Because sourcing PPE from around the world means the NHS may be inadvertently supporting poor labour practices abroad, such as those revealed in the recent Channel 4 investigation of the world's largest manufacturer of medical gloves, Top Glove, who last month announced a tripling of quarterly profits during the lockdown, but they've been dogged by accusations of abusive labour practices since 2018. And the UK government put pressure on the Malaysian government to increase production of gloves uh, amid chronic shortages in our hospitals and care homes. Top gloves factories in Malaysia were revealed as requiring migrant workers to do 12-hour shifts six days a week for a pound and eight p an hour. And then this rogue employer has been a supplier of gloves to Polyco Healthline, a major contractor to the NHS supply chain. How can the public sector ensure our PPE procurement problems don't result in exploitation elsewhere in the world? Thanks, Andrew. And it's an excellent question that we've been working with our colleagues in the International Tra uh, Trade Union Confederation on for some time. And I think it, it goes back to this piece around... Uh, having proper strategic procurement agreements in place, which both look at sourcing locally where that's possible, but also having proper standards and conditionality in when we're sourcing abroad because products just aren't available at the moment in supply chains in the UK. So I think there's a lot more we could do on that. Um, a lot of London boroughs have started looking at their procurement stuff. Uh, the NHS is a member of the Ethical Trading Initiative and has been working on this, where we think there's a lot more the ETI could do. Um, and we are looking to have conversations with City Hall around uh, City Hall's procurement provisions, both across the core GLA, but also the, um, the wider, wider GLA family as well. Because if you look at how much uh, procurement the whole of the um, 
GLA kind of family group of organisations does, it could make a huge difference in terms of labour conditions, both in the UK and, you know, let's not forget we're seeing the, the issues in Leicester at the moment having, you know, a huge impact, which we've been talking about for quite a long time. Um, so, you know, these abuses are present in, in some of the UK supply chain as well. It's not just issues around international supply chains, but we think we can get it right and we can put, um, yeah, some better standards into our procurement and that's part of building back the recovery better. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Can we move on to question from Assembly Member Desai? Assembly Member Desai. I do apologize, sorry. Uh, good afternoon, panel. Um, my question is to Mr. John Dickey and it's about the future of our high streets. So we already had some references um, uh, in the earlier discussion to small businesses, to high streets. Uh, Mr. Cummings uh, talked about small businesses gasping for breath. Uh, Ms. Georgia Gould talked about high streets being at uh, the heart of recovering plants. I couldn't agree more. So, Mr. Dickey, with London boroughs focused on helping localised shopping areas, what is the future for our local high streets? How can they actually be put at the heart of our recovery plants? Well, that's a very interesting question. And one of the big changes I think the last few months has wrought is people are using their high streets a lot more. So a, a sort of paradox, if you like, about what's happened since lockdown is people have been spending more time in their local communities. They have been shopping more locally for the past couple of weeks. They've been eating and drinking out more locally. And I think this is a great shot in the arm for our high streets. But that said, I think some of the structural challenges remain. We need to have much more flexibility around planning policy. It needs to be possible to turn a restaurant into a yoga studio or whatever, if that's what local people want and that's what will drive food fall on the high street. We need to be, I think, more creative around uh, how we enable flexible and mean time uses. One of the things we've argued for is for the GLA to run a register, could be done by boroughs, around those premises which are empty and people locally who would like some space. I think there is a set of issues around broader housing policy and development so that where it's practicable we densify in high streets which again gives you a bit more footfall as well as helping build more homes so i think there is a package of things that could be done by another government to support uh, our high streets over the medium term in the short term i think the really critical thing is that we're very flexible around licensing and you know letting uh, restaurants open a bit longer letting them put tables in the chair and chairs outside easily, whereas do, of course, need to maintain proper health and safety and so forth. But, but around the sort of economics of it, just letting, as uh, Georgia's colleague, uh, Peter John, put it in a webinar we were both on, it comes with just getting out of the way and letting local businesses do stuff will be a great shot in the arm in the short term. Uh, thank you. I only have two minutes of my local time left. So if I could ask you, Georgia, to follow up on that, how do we make sure that recovery plans for our high streets and local economies uh, is flexible uh, for, the, for the huge diversity there is? So if I think of my constituencies, strategies that work for the City of London will be completely different to that in, uh, in Brickland and different again from Stratford to Dagdam. Over the last four years, uh, through my London Moving East campaign, um, I've been promoting East London, getting the right uh, uh, local infrastructure improvements to keep developing its economy. But how do we ensure that this continues pan London, across London? And something else I'm particularly concerned about is impact on outer London local economies of the new permitted development rights changes uh, that will destroy the character of smaller high streets and take away much needed commercial space for small businesses. I mean, as a leading an inner London borough, I absolutely share those concerns. I think that they're London wide um, and cross party around permitted development. You know, we, I think we as local boroughs know our communities. We want to support economic growth and new housing, and we should be trusted to um, uh, make decisions um, about what's best for, for our local places. And all of the evidence shows that permitted development produces poor quality housing um, that isn't fit for purpose. So, so huge concerns around that. On, on the positive side, um, I think that as part of the economic recovery work, we want to, to invest in high streets um, across the capital and look at um, innovation and exemplar high streets. Um, and th there are huge opportunities to do that. So that could be kind of innovations, looking at innovation zones around business rates or other policy levers. Um, it, it, I, I, I love John's idea around um, a uh, 
um, looking at empty premises and c making it much easier to, to bring, um, uh, meanwhile, use culture and arts organisations um, into into those looking at the circular economy, looking at citizen participation, making sure that high streets are um, thriving civic centres, um, and and that that sits across the capital. And so what we're really keen to do is, um, as part of this joint working, um, is work with boroughs, so so people are innovating in their local place. So as you say, um, uh, what what's best for for, for um, different parts of London is is, is very different. Um, but having that um, central connectivity so we're able to scale best practice really quickly um, to, to share learning um, and and to, to kind of keep a coordinated approach with with local leadership and and there's there's huge energy around this already um, both on the short term around licensing changes and we're seeing some of those come about but also around um, active travel um, changes to make it, it safer to people for people to walk um, and social distance and, and access their, their high streets so I, I think this is what we'll see unfolding very quickly. Thank you, Georgia. I like what you said. Thriving civic centers. That's what we all want. I've run out of time, but Sam, I would like a trade union perspective from you in writing, speaking as a trade unionist uh, and a member of the GMB myself. Thank you, Chair. Assembly Member Moore. Yeah, uh, and I'd like to move on to the future of workspace. Um, so to John Dickey and uh, Jace Tyrrell, um, is home working here to stay? And if so, what is... Uh, the, what impact will this and a shift away from central and an office spaces have on London's economy? And what does the mayor need to do to support that central London economy? Uh, well, should I go first on offices and let Jace come in afterwards? I would say that uh, the, 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 the trend towards home working and more flexible working, which was present in the economy before we had the lockdown, uh, will certainly have been accelerated. And I think there are an awful lot of professional services firms who are working perfectly uh, 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 product productively at home, and they don't think they're going to be returning to nine to five, five days a week working anytime soon. That said, I think equally pretty much everybody wants to get more people back in the office soon, because there's a whole range of, of, of things you can do face-to-face -face and in offices from serendipitous water cooler conversations to some kinds of meetings that you just can't do remotely. So I think that we are going to see a return to the office. I think we're going to see a return to the office in the sort of short to medium term that will be phased and partial. And I think the future demand for office space will remain. We may see it configured differently. Indeed, I think we'll certainly see it configured differently. We're going to see perhaps a bit more flexibility in what firms are going to want to take. But I think the demand to be in the central activity zone the most productive part of Europe by a country mile is going to remain strong. Jason. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I mean, I'd echo everything John says. I mean, we already saw this trend in, in the, the change. And I think for retail, just to go back on that change as well, you know, this pronounced shift to online, uh, but also this to shop in a sustainable way, to come to your office in a sustainable way. But for the West End, as John says, it's not just about coming to retail or coming to work in the office, it's everything else that is part of that and the good outcomes that come from people actually physically coming together. And the future of retail will still require people coming to physical stores. And two thirds of our buildings across Bond Street, Oxford Street and Regent Street are office tenants. You know, they are our customers. We built this 16 billion crossrail line so more people can commute to the center of London uh, to support that. So it will change, but it's still here to stay. But I think this point on sustainable city centers not just environmental, but economic sustainability. You know, we, we can't lose that. And I think we've got to think really hard on the recovery. And I know it's being raised with the various recovery conversations. What does that mean for our, as Georgia says, these thriving civic centres? And I think the other point uh, was raised around sort of permitted development and change of use. Westminster City Council have been excellent with change of use policy, their city plan. But I think we've got to recognise that the international centre of the West End, it does need local solutions. And I'm sure every borough and every bit of London recognises that as well. So we need to be careful national policy changes and how they're implemented locally. Oh, thank you very much uh, for that. And I'd, li I'd like just now to, to change tack very slightly um, and, and ask uh, Sam uh, Gurney and, and Phil Philip Graham. I mean, many people have enjoyed the freedom of working from home uh, and some, uh, but some uh, can't and are worried about their return to work. Um, many Londoners have struggled working in unsuitable conditions. So what advice 
can you provide to employers so that the mental and physical well-being of workers is taken into account when decisions are made about working from home in the future? And what can the mayor do to encourage best working practices? Thanks, Alison. It's, a, it's been a huge issue, obviously, with people um, you know, suddenly and unexpectedly having to work from home now. We've long advocated kind of more flexibility and employers making it easier for people who can work at home to be able to do that if it, if it suits them. That comes with a whole load of issues in terms of things like health and safety regulations, making sure that risk assessments take place. Now, obviously, we've been really concentrating at the moment on risk assessments for people who are returning to external workplaces. But the same thing applies to people who are going to be working at home, making sure that you've got a decent workstation, making sure that you've got the proper kit. So there's been quite a lot of information which has been going out to union reps and health and safety reps on how to work that. We've seen government advice on, on the possibility of hot desking obviously kind of changing, so that's going to be much more difficult. So lots of firms and, and public sector employees who've kind of built business models based on the fact that colleagues were going to be working from home some of the time and then coming in and hot desking for some of the time and that's not going to be possible. So there are going to be huge changes there. So there's, there's a lot of advice. We've been doing quite a lot of webinars, TC education material on this, um, and our health and safety people are looking at what advice should go out to the 100,000 health and safety reps, union health and safety reps who are out there to make sure that they can support people who are working at home. So it's something that lots of them have been doing because lots of health and safety reps in uh, local authorities, for instance, have been having to look at this already and working with councils on how you do that. Um, obviously, in, in private sector workplaces, that's been happening as well. Just one very quick point, which is, as well as the impact, um, kind of the other knock-on impact is, is a sector of jobs where we're going to see losses if there is going to be reduced people going into offices. So cleaners, security guard, facilities maintenance. So when we're looking at people who are going to need retraining and skills support and people, these are often people in already quite badly uh, treated insecure sectors, but they're going to need support because there is very likely to be um, a loss of jobs for those colleagues as well. Thank you very much. And actually, I'm out of time. Apologies to Jace Tyrrell. Sorry, Jace. <laughs> right. Can we move on to Assembly Member Qureshi, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to uh, move the debates for skills for the future now. And can I start by asking uh, Jordan, Jordan Cummins, will there be a greater demand for digital skills required in the post-COVID-19 economy and what types of skills will that be? Thank you. I, I mean, there's a resounding yes. Uh, we've already seen yep. uh, a lot of our members have been coming forward and saying uh, they already knew uh, that they had uh, gaps in their digital skills provision, but they've only been exacerbated. So undoubtedly, there is going to be a, 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 sp a spike. I do think, however, there is no crystal ball to say which skill sets are going mm -hmm. to be needed for which jobs are still going to remain, quite frankly, after the pandemic. And there is going to be a lot of evolution of, of job briefs. Will there be a... a Will jobs uh, in the future be kind of part time and then the other half of that job that was previously always done by a person will be done by some kind of algorithm or a robot or, or all of these things that, that happen on digital transformations. So um, undoubtedly, yes, I do think there is a, a, a sometimes a bit of a first mover uh, kind of thing with, with big employers as to mm. kind of who wants to put their who wants to put a uh, nail their flag to the mask and, and saying this is the skill set that our industry really is going to need and this is what our business needs uh, as soon as possible, but also um, going back to the um, careers advice point, uh, not enough employees really have solid roots, I would say, into the curriculum. And, and you know, the British system does rely quite heavily on how people are, are taught and, 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 and the route into, into work mm. from there. Um, so I would say that there is a, there's a huge need, but I wouldn't say that actually that, that firms have a, 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 a real grasp as to when that need is going to change uh, and exactly what that skill set is going to look like. There is also a massive spike in emotional intelligence and resilience and all of these additional skills that don't always get trained into young people um, that are probably even more needed now that they might they might be spending time at home and not in an office space. So um, there's going to be a mix, I would say, of soft and hard skills, but, but, a, but a real distinct need for digital. Thank you, uh, Jordan. Can I now go to uh, uh, Sam Gurney at the TUC? Uh, could those Londoners who've lost their jobs as a result of COVID-19 pandemic and those Londoners who've been unemployed for a long period be priorities for skilled programmes to deal with this digital shortfall? shortfall? Absolutely. I mean, I think that's going to be crucial. We've, we've called already for a, 
a national jobs guarantee scheme. Um, we were working before this crisis with various colleagues on the business side, CBI, etc., on the national retraining scheme. And so kind of calls for um, to bring some of that funding forward and investment in, in skills so that everybody should have a right to retrain. That should be backed up by a personal lifelong learning account so people have got that. And then the things should be put in place to make sure people can access things like the digital training they're going to need. And I said, when we look at the sectors that are going to be most hit, um, it's absolutely right to say, if we look at, you know, well, at least 10% of jobs in London are at, at high risk, and that, that jumps to 18 to 20% of people 25 or under. Um, but you're going to have a lot of older workers as well who are going to be losing jobs as a result of this. So if we look at kind of what's going to happen around the aviation industry, as I was just saying, some of the kind of business support sectors where you've got people who are already in insecure work, who are some of the people who've got the least access at the moment to some of those skills, um, digital skills, etc. And there's going to be a really urgent need uh, right. to make sure people can access those. And within London, we've got the ability to do some of that because we've got devolved adult education budget. We've done some really good stuff on making sure that people who are on London Living Wage or under get access to, to free training. And we need to ramp that up and make sure we've got the funding going into it and make sure people are signposted to where that support and training is. Thank you, Sam. And can I finally ask... Uh... Councillor Georgina Gould, uh, you manage a third of the, the West End uh, and the West End Partnership have identified cultural and technological group, growth as key sectors of creating new jobs and skills in the West End to fill the, the hole in the, in the middle. What part do you think uh, councils can play in the digital, with digital skills uh, in, in these locations? Um a huge role I, just on the last point i think digital skills is one of the the key areas that we're focused on in terms of the london recovery both basic digital skills um mm. for, for retraining for those who have gone have lost their job kind of late in their career and and need some basic digital skills right through to high level digital skills that um some of the industries that the um the, the growing tech industries we have um in our area so Camden um, is not just the West End, but King's Cross, which is one of the kind of heart of, of digital growth in the city. Companies like Google and Facebook are there. And we set up something called the Steam Commission in Camden, which brings together um, all of our big kind of digital and creative companies to work with us um, to give young people the digital skills. So we have a Steam Hub embedded in our schools where teachers work on curriculum development with some of those companies and, and further education to ensure that right through um, their, their school journey, that they're having opportunities to be involved in digital challenges, to get the skills, the fusion skills that they need. I think that that dual, that dual creativity and, and kind of technical digital skills that uh, I think industry are really asking for. And then that there are pathways into jobs in those sectors. Um, and so that's just one example, but I think that's the kind of work we want to expand um, uh, through the recovery and renewal work. Thank you very much, Chair and Georgia. Right, uh, next one is uh, Assembly Member Duval. Thank you very much, Chair. I mean, the proof and the outcome of the work of the London Recovery Board is by this autumn, there should be some practical actions that make a real difference to try and minimize the economic downturn. But in all the hours that I've just been listening through, no one seems to have mentioned that we've already got a leap. I'm not sure what the London Recovery Board adds to uh, the work of that. Can you tell me uh, what's the difference in its roles and isn't there a risk of overlap and duplication or are we going to collapse the leap and put and invest time and energy into the London Recovery Board? George Gold, please. Yeah, sure. Um, so, so the LEAP is still an incredibly important body, and that's where the funding will will run through in terms of um, the the ongoing um, projects that are, that are being funded, capital investment, and that is absolutely key to London's economic recovery. The recovery board is is particularly focused on on um, developing quickly ideas for London's economic recovery, but it absolutely works in partnership with the LEAP. I've, um, I sit on both, as does Sam, and we um, are, are ensuring that the two work together. I think that the, the role that we play with the economic recovery is is to mobilise new coalitions um, to act on, on some of these issues So um, and link together the, the work um, of employment and skills, um, 
uh, and, and economic growth. And so there are lots of other bodies that also exist, cultural partnerships, the Employment and Skills Board that I also sit on. Um, and this is about bringing all of that work together in a coherent way around some key priorities um, on recovery. So increasing green, um, uh, the green economy in London, uh, ensuring that, that Council London... Council Gould, that, I'm that sorry. Work. Council Gould, I apologise, but uh, Labour Group is out of time, so you may want to send in a written uh, yeah, answer uh, via me, please. Thank you very much. Uh, can I bring in uh, Assembly Member Prince, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, as the only representative of the GLA family, uh, could I look to Philip Graham, please? Um, would you agree that the, uh, the point that Jace Tyrrell made um, when he was saying that there's a not a very good comparison with London when you look at other major cities who are getting far more people on their public transport now than we are. Do you think that's possibly down to confidence on public transport? Uh, and could that reason possibly be because people don't feel safe on our transport system? Um, I'm constantly getting complaints from my constituencies about non non-enforcement of wearing a face mask. Would you like to comment on that, Philip? Um, I, don't think, I don't think I can comment specifically on what, what individuals' reasons for, for the choices that they make are, but I mean, it is undoubtedly the case, as Jace has said, that some other cities have seen a faster uptick in, uh, in, in transport use, in transport usage than we have since the, the restriction of lockdown. Some of that, you know, is about getting clear and clear and consistent messaging, as we have said previously. And I think that is something that has to work across transport and health. And I think the fact that the that we've seen the government now move properly to, to say that face cut, as the mayor had said well before, that face covering should be worn on public transport means that we've got a clear and consistent message about that. And I can't comment on specific instances of enforcement, but at least we know what it is we are enforcing mm -hmm. now. Um, but I think as we go forward, you know, as, um, as, those, as those messages shift, as we get to something that is consistent across the transport and the health side, and we recognise the, uh, the need to look at this very, very closely and to move, and to move forward as quickly as we can on, open, on quickly as we can safely on opening this up, that, that we want confidence to build and we need to be clear about the communications that we have around the fact that capacity is there, that the, that the system is cleaner than it's ever been, that staff are trained to support and that where necessary people will be able to use the, use, use the, the public transport services. Well, clearly, uh, Philip, the message around enforcement is not happening. The Mayor had the option to, to make it compulsory to wear face masks before uh, the government introduced it, but uh, there is no enforcement, there, there is no messaging. I had the misfortune to have to use public transport last week. Uh, I found that the, the very best, there was 80% compliance, but on one or two journeys, up to 50% of people were not wearing face masks. There was no messaging on the trains to tell people to wear face masks. There was no messaging on the platforms to tell people to wear face masks. There were no, there was no uh, announcements to do that and of course there was no one actually reminding people as you entered onto the platforms or on through the gates that they needed to wear face masks. I mean it is a complete mess, a complete failure by the mayor to make an enforcement of face masks and I would suggest to you that's the very reason why people are very reticent to use our system whereas in other uh, cities which have been pointed out by Jace Tyrrell that they're much more confident in using their public transport. I mean, it's a complete failure by the mayor to enforce the one thing that he's been bleating on about. Well, I would, uh, all I can say is your experience of using public transport is very, in recently, is very different from mine. When I recently had to travel on a on a train service, there were there were large posters up very clearly right at the entrance to the station. The staff were all wearing masks. Um, when this policy was first introduced, we provided free face masks people to encourage take up you know i think i think your experience is different from mine but i can't comment on particular journeys that you've been involved in 
Well, well the irony uh, of assembly it, member uh, is, Prince. Is that, sorry, the irony of it is that uh, it was actually also Network Rail and Southwest Rail staff who weren't wearing masks. But I can't blame the mayor for that. So thank that's my that's me finished. Thank you very much. Uh, Sam Gurney has uh, indicated. You want to hear him? No, I'm sorry, oh. I haven't enough time. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Move on to Assembly Member Bailey. Um, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to go back and cover this ground of additional support for particular groups. Um, what does that look like from the recovery programme? Who gets to decide oh. which, which groups we are going to um, support more and why? We talked a lot about the BAME community and the impact of, of COVID on, on my community, but also white working class men have had very poor health outcomes from it. So who is identifying which groups are going to be supported and what's the criteria around that? Um, to, to Council Georgia and maybe to Philip Graham as well. So fundamentally, the, um, the money and um, decisions about what we what kind of support we're able to offer come down from the government. Um, this is, you know, these are DWT, DWP programmes um, and what we're pushing for is to have more influence on that support. We invest at a, a borough level over and above that and we often take a targeted approach or those... Um, and we, we will look at the, you know, the evidence of who that group's, group is, and it's a whole range from from young people. Um, we're seeing particular um, a particular impact on on women around around 30 years old. Um, there's some um, uh, some evidence of older workers. So I think we will take an evidence based approach to to support those um, in our community who are at most at risk. But we we are we the the kind of the funding and, and resource for that. Um, you know, some of it will come through the Kickstart program, and we're pushing to, to have more involvement as boroughs and in, in, in that program because we know our communities and we're able to to um, use that support. And through, uh, we understand that that money for long-term unemployed will be coming from the um, Work and Health program. And again, we we need, we're, we're pushing to to have to have more understanding of that. But um, at the moment, that they, they the support seems to be quite centrally defined from central government um, and. And local government is pushing to, to um, have more of a say. Oh, because from a London Recovery Board point of view, it sounded like you were saying you would um, support different groups. And all I'm saying is, that's great, but we need some kind of indication what what determines a vulnerable group and why. There needs to be a rationale around who we support and why, because we hear the same groups mentioned all the time. And myself, as a member of the BAME community, I'm very glad to hear us mentioned all the time, but I, I we seem to be neglecting people who are... Who are not, you know, the the the, the favoured the favoured son or daughter. I, I bring up working class white men who've had horrific horrific health outcomes, and I just make a plea to make sure there's a proper um, framework for what 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 a vulnerable group looks like in any part of the work, any parts that your works touch, especially when it comes to the redistribution of resources, because they, they, there's obviously going to be a tension around that. But just moving on to, to Philip, what's the mayor's take on this? What, 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 who is the mayor using to identify vulnerable groups? What is the criteria for that? And how, how will that work manifest itself? Well, I think I don't, I don't have a huge amount to add to what, what Georgia has said. I mean, I think there is not going to be a, I, I don't think there is, you know, the direction on this will be set by the recovery board, which is about bringing together um, camp boroughs with London councils and the GLA with some of the key external stakeholders in this, and that includes um, representatives of community groups and and so on. Um, but when it comes to individual programmes, you know, there isn't going to be a, a blanket, these are the groups who must be targeted to every single programme. We're going to look at where, you know, where the challenges are and which groups have been, have been hit most badly in terms of the health outcomes, in terms of poverty outcomes, in terms of employment, and actually follow the evidence in terms of, in terms of where that takes us as we design those programmes. Indeed, as we have tried to do over the course of, our, over the, course of the GLA's work over, over many years. F Philip, that sounds entirely reasonable, but of course, my example shows that are we actually following the science? And I just make a plea, there must be a rationale for these things. Also, I will have arguments on the ground about who's being favoured and who isn't. That, that's the point I want to make. But I see Sam. Sam, you, do you want to come in, Sam? Go on, get by. Sam. Tried to get... Uh... I can hear you, Sam. 
Can you hear me? Sorry, am I unmuted? Sorry, I was just saying, I mean, I think that's, it's a very strong point, but I'd, I'd like to assure you as somebody who's also on the recovery board, that those kind of indices of class, ethnicity and gender all come into this. And I think you're, you know, we're right to say all the figures show that if you're working age, this has been an occupational disease in many ways. And so actually it's been because of where people are concentrated in the labour market. So not, not when we're looking at people who are retired and have died in care homes and stuff, but if we're looking at workers, there's been a disproportionate impact of people who, as I said, are in insecure jobs, cleaners, security guards, care homes. Now, it happens to be that for, for structural reasons of structural inequality, as I said right at the beginning, you've got a higher concentration of women of, of all ethnicities and a higher concentration of, of BAME men and women in those jobs. But that's not at all to take away from the fact that we absolutely need to be looking, as I said, at the class impact of this on people across all groups in London and certainly from a trade union point of view that's something which we've been highlighting and will continue to highlight and have confidence that, that other colleagues on the recovery board um, are looking at that as well and so it's kind of not around medicalisation on that it's around what are the structural underpinnings of why there's been a disproportionate impact well, you know. and, you're, and you're right to say kind of you know it's impacted massively on people who who haven't been able to work at home, who've had to still carry on going into work, um, and they've died in much greater numbers. And we need to understand that as part of the transition process and the recovery process. Thank you, Sam. Chair, thank you. Assembly Member Buff, please. Assembly Member Buff, can you hear us? You did it right this time, Chair. <laughs> 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 sorry, sorry. Um, I, I wanted to have a word with Georgia Gould, who brought up the um, question of, uh, of the impact of COVID-19 on housing. I just wondered if um, Camden Council itself would be reviewing its uh, housing policies in the light of uh, the COVID-19 uh, outbreak. Um, well, I mean, the housing, it's... Um, one of the, the big challenges and overcrowding uh, within it. For, for Camden Council, we've had a housing policy that prioritises overcrowded families for a long time. I think over the last couple of years, thousands of out of overcrowded households. Uh, and lots of like, big um, uh, we've got a big council house building programme and the mayor has, has backed council house building across the capital and it that is the, the needs in London. So we, we're hoping to be able to accelerate that. We do have, we put forward to the government a number of shovel-ready um, council house building projects um, and uh, we, we, we're hoping to seek some kind of quite ambitious funding for council housing because it, um, it helps both produce jobs and to, to meet that overcrowding. There is a specific area we are looking at though which is in terms of preventing a, book, a second wave and whether we can have more kind of isolation spaces for overcrowded families to support people to safely um, isolate during any um, a, a, a future um, second wave that, that, that might continue. So that's as part of our own disproportionate impact work. That's, that's something that's coming up in, as an issue and something um, we're looking at. So these are changes that have taken place as a result or on your policy as a result of your experience of the lockdown, is that correct? The flooring, yeah. Yeah. Um, how much is the mayor supporting um, uh, particularly uh, programmes to alleviate overcrowding in your borough? Uh, as I set out, I mean, the, the, the biggest programme to alleviate overcrowding is council house building. Um, and we are, you know, focused in Camden building family size. Um, council homes and the mayor has since since and um, this mayor's come in we've seen big investment in those council house building um program so, and that so has, has he particularly has he particularly prioritized uh family sized homes well he supported our council house building program that 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 that, oh, asked, that does um prioritize um family sized homes how, how much how much additional grant do you get to build those family sized homes I couldn't tell you the specific figure off the top of my head, but it but it has been significant. It would be great uh, if you could forward that to us. How much specifically the mayor has put into particularly family-sized homes? Um, and um, I also wanted to ask, um, perhaps TfL, um, uh, do you think it would be a positive contribution to 
uh, London's economy and the recovery to accelerate the house building program. Any takers? Sorry, did you? Who is the question addressed to? Is this somebody from TfL here? TfL isn't here. All right. Uh, do you think, therefore, generally, do any of the pan panel consider it would be an advantage for London's economy to accelerate the house building program? Uh, who wants yes. to take? I mean Anyone? No, it wouldn't. Let's what? slow it down. Um, any well, I mean, <laughs> okay. clearly, the 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 mayor convened the the housing the ha a housing task force to look at sort of the role of housing post COVID, and I mean, I think that um, indicated fairly fairly clearly that you know, in the first instance, restarting and kickstarting the uh, the ha the homes building program and getting it getting it back to where it was previously is critical for the COVID recovery, and I think further acceleration would, would, undoubt, would undoubtedly be valuable in that regard. Good. Let's tell the Mayor that. Thank you. Right. Uh, that uh, uh, completes uh, the whole uh, set of questions uh, to our guests. Uh, thank, uh, can I thank our guests for answering our questions today? The Assembly has a few more uh, items of business to deal with, but please feel free now to leave uh, the team's uh, call whilst we deal with those. Uh, may I once again thank uh, our panel of guests for uh, their, their uh, contribution today. And uh, uh, stay on if you like to, but uh, free to go as we, whilst we deal with uh, the rest of the business. Uh, we now turn uh, to the motion listed on the agenda in my name. Can I ask that the Assembly notes the answers to the question asked? Agreed. 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 Uh, we Agreed. have been submitted an amendment uh, which uh, oh. is in the name of uh, Assembly Member Sean Bailey. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to make this, 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 this motion because we, we are, our jobs are to sit in front of the Mayor's team and have the Mayor brought to account to answer our questions. We do this on behalf of Londoners. It's very disappointing to have nobody here from the mayor's team at this unprecedented time when we are talking about the economic regeneration of London, which of course is important to the whole country. So to have no one from here from the mayor's team is very disappointing. If you if you just take the last question asked by my colleague, um, um, Assemblymember Boff, there's no one here from the mayor's team to answer that very important question. Will, will we relook at his housing priorities to help London recover, both from a health, physical health point of view and a financial point of view? There's nobody here to answer that question. And I think it's a real shame that we don't have representation, i.e. leadership, it's at this time when London needs it most. And that's why I think this motion is the right thing to do. I don't, I don't say it to, to score points. We all know that we, they, we'll have many arenas where we can fight. But if the, the, the London Assembly, if we as Assembly members are to look our constituents in, our, in their faces, Londoners in their faces, we have to be able to tell them we've challenged the mayor, we have spoken to the mayor, we've heard from the mayor. And on this, possibly the single most important thing happening in London, if not the whole country, we have not heard from the mayor because there is no deputy mayor here. I find that very, very distressing. I would like that firmly placed on the record. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah. Assembly Member Hall has indicated She's seconding the motion. Uh, do you want to uh, have your uh, comments now, please, Assembly Member Hall? Yes, I would. Um, thank you, Chairman. Five minutes. Ex yeah, maximum. Okay, I won't take that long because obviously I agree completely with Assembly Member Bailey. It is absolutely appalling that the deputy mayors are not doing their job properly. You only have to listen to the stories of the, the professionals that have come here, have given up their time to talk to us today. Those deputy mayors should be there listening to that, being able to answer things back from that. There are many questions that I suspect many of us, certainly the Conservative group I can speak for, yeah. would have liked to have put um, politically-based um, questions to the deputy mayors, asking them, 
what they're going to do about this and that. Lots of them are in charge of different funding pots. It would be interesting to see if they're going to rebalance those funding pots in order to help our poor uh, business sector. If we don't assist the business sector, it could die completely. It is no good constantly having a go at the government. We are here to keep the mayor and his many deputy mayors to account. That is our job. And if they're not sitting in front of us prepared to answer questions, then uh, it just begs the question, what are they there for? I've written to Rajesh. I've written to the mayor. I've even tweeted to them asking them to come. Absolutely nothing back in response. I think it's a disgrace. It shouldn't be allowed to happen again. And whatever your politics uh, as an assembly member, you should be appalled that the deputy mayors are not prepared to come out and answer our questions. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Do I have any contributions for, from any other assembly members? I don't see any. Uh, assembly member Bailey, do you want to sum up? Do you need to sum up? <laughs> I, I, thank you, Chair. I'll just sum up by saying this. <clears throat> Excuse me. We've had expert guests give up their time, come and represent London in, in a very clear, concise and productive way. But some of that, some of that uplift, some of that brilliance will be missed because, again, there's nobody here from the mayor's team. And it is it, it's disappointing. It's disgraceful. And, and it's 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 a bad thing. We have experts here who have, who have years of experience who have willingly given it to us willingly give to us, and the mayor is not here to receive that. It's actions like this that slow down the recovery of London, and the mayor's team need to take a long, hard look at themselves. There's a number of people on that team who they could have sent, they've decided to send no one, and that's a loss not just to the GLA, but it's a loss to all Londoners. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, we need to take a vote on this uh, amendment. Uh, uh, is... Chair, I yes. don't think we... Sorry, I don't I... think we need to take the vote. I think there is, um, looking at the wording of the motion, I think most Assembly members would agree with it. So to avoid the time in taking a vote, because we've got a lot of business to get on with, and there will be lots of votes on that other business, we could just agree this uh, in terms of... I don't think there's any dissent from the wording of the amendment that's been proposed to you. That's very helpful, and... Uh... Yep. Given that there's consensus, uh, can we agree that this uh, amendment has been uh, agreed unanimously? Agreed. Thank you. Now, before we go to adjournment, uh, as we have planned, uh, can we agree to extend the meeting time from 1.30 to whatever time it takes to uh, complete the substantial business we have in terms of motions, as well as an indication of emergency motion? Can we agree to that? Great. Thank you. Agreed. Also, given that uh, we have six motions, I think six amendments, plus more business, can I suggest that uh, instead of five minutes, we have adjournment for 10 minutes, which will give enough time for uh, everyone to uh, organize uh, to make sure that uh, we have a smooth running of uh, the rest of the business. Is that agreed? Agreed. Okay, Agreed. in that case, uh, my time shows here uh, 1325. So can we come back uh, uh, at uh, 1335, please? Thank you very much.
Assembly members, we are back again. Let's uh, resume the business. Uh, item number five, which is petitions. Can I ask Assembly member Caroline Pigeon uh, to present the petition listed on the agenda in her name? Thank you very much, Chair. I've got a petition that's been organised by Richmond Councillor Avril Quelo, 234 signatures, and the prayer reads, Disabled passengers have wide-ranging conditions and many have been shielding for these but rely on public transport for work. Spaces will be limited and many won't be able to stand at stops without seats for long waiting for public transport to arrive with capacity for them due to limited spaces from social distancing on board. Face coverings on public transport became mandatory on the 15th of June 2020 and removing these to explain a hidden disability puts them at greater risk. This petition calls for face masks for extremely vulnerable registered disabled persons freedom pass holders who will have no choice but to use public transport to travel to work as soon as shielding ends with the same information as a blue card printed on the mask. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Can I ask the Assembly to agree to forward the petition to the Deputy Mayor for Transport? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Uh, petitions update item number six. Can I ask the Assembly to note the response received to a petition presented to the Assembly? Agreed. Thank you. Agreed. Now we come uh, to the motions. Uh, right. We have uh, six motions before us. Can we start with uh, motion number one, which is in the name of uh, Assembly Member Hall, which is to do with the uh, nominated party scheme seconded by Assembly Member Prince. Assembly Member Hall. Okay, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'll keep the proposing of this motion brief because I'm conscious that this is something that we debate every year at budget time. But I do think it might come as a surprise to many Londoners that not many passes exist at all. Uh, let's remember what they are, the passes which allow housemates and live-in family of Transport for London workers to use the transport network for free. When we looked at this earlier this year, the GLA finance officers accepted our estimate that these will lose the TfL £44 million a year in revenue. At a time when Transport for London's finances are in such dire straits, and with the Mayor saying he's looking at nearly £500 million worth of cuts, including potentially cutting over £100 million from the police, it cannot be right that TfL continue with this luxurious perk. At the moment, TfL are relying on government and indeed taxpayer money to survive, and lots of companies and organisations are in the same boat <coughs> and experiencing real difficulties. But across <coughs> London and indeed the country, people are still making efficiencies and making compromises, looking at the essentials over the nice-to-haves. Why should TfL be immune to having to do this? The Mayor has long said that he can't unpick nominee passes from terms and conditions. We're saying, find a way. Other people are having to do much less to make their ends meet. So work with TfL to abolish this scheme. It's the right thing to do, and it's also the fair thing to do. You know, Thank it's you, Chair. Sorry, can you have uh, those who are not speaking, your microphones muted, please? Thank you. Sorry, Assembly Member Hall. If you want to carry on. No, oh, I've finished. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, Assembly Member Prince, do you want to speak now in seconding uh, the motion? No, Chair, I, I, I second and reserve my right. Thank you. I have one indication. Uh, uh, the first one is from uh, Assembly Member Moore. Thank you, Chair. Um, I will only speak briefly, but I want to be clear that my group will be opposing this motion. This is the latest sure. in a long... This is a, the latest in a long line of Conservative group attacks on the nominee passes scheme. That's clear from looking back at numerous previous mayoral answers um, and Conservative uh, amendment budget proposals, where, frankly, it looks like there has been a bit of creative accounting to boost your case. Uh, in fact, uh, Gareth Bacon received an answer to a mayor's question just yesterday, making it clear that while TfL uh, were looking at a range of options to reduce costs, removing nominee passes was unlikely to result in any significant additional income. That answer makes it clear once again 
to you that this benefit is a long-standing part of terms and conditions of TfL employees and that passes in their current form have existed since 2002 under successive mayors. And further, that there is no cost because the number of journeys historically has been a tiny proportion. There not be any cost. Yeah. The, Sorry. Uh, the 11 million tube and bus journeys made per day pre-COVID, meaning that no additional services would be operated. In fact, in June 2015, Boris Johnson, when he was mayor, said nominee passes are something that have been part of the London Transport and staff of London Transport uh, f uh, who work very hard and do an incredible job since the 1930s and at least since, the 19, in, since 1948, I quote that. To withdraw them would have been extremely costly and that it would lead to poor industrial relations. Frankly, at a time when many TfL staff have been putting themselves out there in the front line during a COVID crisis to keep our transport system working for Londoners, potentially putting themselves and their families at risk, this motion leaves a very sour taste and is untimely and damaging attack on transport staff. And I call on all members to reject this motion. Thank you, Mayor. Huh. Right. I have an indication from Assemblymember Russell. Assemblymember Russell, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, Green Assembly members will not be voting for this motion. I would like to quickly note that Transport for London nominee passes are part of employee contracts. Therefore, to remove this benefit requires negotiation with and involvement of workers and unions. Further, all previous mayors have rejected this request. The last time was in November 2018, when the current mayor responded to a written question on the matter, saying... This benefit is a long-standing part of the terms and conditions of Transport for London staff. There is no cost to TfL because the number of journeys is a tiny proportion of the 11 million tube and bus journeys made per day, meaning no additional services need to be operated. All TfL employees and their nominees are expected to act as ambassadors for TfL, helping ensure the security of the system and helping assist our customers where necessary. Thank you. Assemblymember Bailey. Just, just in answer to those comments, firstly, no mayor has lived through the times we're living through now. This is an exceptional case. Yes, we've always spoken about this, and all this has done is strengthen the need for that to happen. And I think it's, 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 it's wrong to ask people who do not work for TfL to act as ambassadors for TfL and give them this inducement to do so. We're not talking about removing this to, um, free travel from TfL staff. We're talking about the nominee portion of this. And the fact that it's part of terms and conditions should be no defence against saving Londoners money at this time. This is something that's always needed to happen and now particularly needs to happen. We will go on to have debates about TfL's finances and all the other tough decisions we're going to make. And yet we entirely shield people from that tough conversation who do not work directly for TfL. I think that is wrong. And that's why we will be voting for this motion. Hear, hear. Hear, hear. I do not have uh, any further indications. So can I ask uh, <laughs> Assembly Member Hall if she would like to sum up or... Uh, Ready for votes? Uh, well, sorry, I will... sorry, Chair, I, I have the right of reply. Uh, no. There is isn't an amendment. <laughs> I think he does. I think, Chairman, he does have the right to reply as he seconded it. Yeah, okay. All right, Assemblymember Prince. Uh, I'm, I'm sure. Sure. Chair. Sorry, sorry about that. Can I just yeah. can I take clarification, Chair? I don't think a seconder has a right to reply. It's the, it's the proposer that has the right to reply to end no, the I've, debate, not the seconder. I've, I've, he's I've reserved it. his right to speak. Sorry. He reserved yeah. his right to speak. He's got Correct. a right to come in before the right to, the right yeah. to reply. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, you're right, Rain. Right. You are right, yeah. But it, I've got, I reserve my right to speak. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Go on. Oh, thank you. Right, okay, very quick. I mean... In these really difficult times, I think uh, Assemblymember Baylor made it very clear, nothing should be off the table. I mean, we are actually looking at moving, closing City Hall. The Mayor's looking at closing City Hall, which will make similar sort of savings to this. And that is on the table. But looking at not giving free tickets to people who don't work for TfL, who are not related to the people who work to TfL, surely that must be on the table. 
Um, for people to say, oh, this has been on the card for a long, long time. Well, if it's been on for a long, long time, it must be time to review it in these very difficult times. Very simple. I urge you to support the motion. Thank you. Right. Now, Assembly Member Hall, if you want to sum uh, up. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I'll just go through a couple of comments. Creative accounting, it is not. I think if you heard my introduction, I would say to you that the GLA finance officers accepted our estimate that there, that is a £44 million loss to them. Uh, to say that there, there's no cost to these going outs is utterly ridiculous. And if previous mayors had said it, I still say it's utterly ridiculous. If somebody wants to go from A to B, they either buy a ticket or they use their free nominee pass. So there would be money coming into TfL for that. I think it's a ludicrous, ludicrous thing to say, quite frankly. And yeah, yeah. terms and conditions can be changed. We are in unprecedented times. The amount of money that taxpayers are having to put into TfL to keep it afloat is one point. But there's another very, very important point here. Given the finances, there could be lots of redundancies at TfL. I suspect if you asked those people that work at TfL that may well be subject to redundancies, they would much rather that TfL saved £44 million in order that they kept their jobs than the fact that somebody's flatmate can go from A to B free of charge, except of course it isn't. There is a cost to it. Of course there's a cost. And we, as taxpayers, and Londoners as taxpayers, are paying for that. I would therefore urge you to actually vote for this. It's a sensible way of hopefully keeping more jobs in TfL. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, can we move on to votes, please, now? Uh, I'm going to call each member alphabetically, Chair. Um, I'll ask members to indicate whether they are voting uh, in favour, against, or are abstaining on the motion. Uh, I will call uh, Assembly members alphabetically with the <coughs> Deputy Chairman and the Chair listed last. So, uh, first of all, we have Assembly Arnold, who submitted apologies, Assembly ba Member Bacon, who submitted apologies. So, Assembly Member Bailey. As Assembly Member Bailey. Can I have your vote, please? Excuse me, four. I, I was speaking to myself. Excuse me, four. Four. Thank you. Assembly Member Berry. Again. This is painful. Against, thank you. Assembly Member Boff. Four. Assembly Member Cooper. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm against this motion. Thank Assembly you. Member Desai. Uh, Chair, against. Assembly Member Devonish. Four. <laughs> Assembly Member yet. Dismore. Against. Assembly Member Duval. No, no. Okay. Assembly Member Eshalomi. Assembly Member Eshalomi. She's on the call. Is Assembly she... Member Gavron. Against. Assembly Member Hall. For. Assembly Member Curtin has left the call, I believe. Assembly Member McCartney? Against. Assembly <coughs> Member Moore? Against. Assembly Member O'Connell? For. Assembly Member Pigeon? For. Assembly Member Prince? For. Assembly Member Qureshi? Against. Assembly Member Russell. Against. Assembly Member Dr. Sahota. Against. Assembly Member Whittler's left the call. Uh, Assembly Member Arbour. Oh. Before I call the chair's vote, can I just see if Assembly Member Eshalomi is there? In that case, Assembly Member Shah. Against. That is 12 votes against chair oh, and. And, uh, don't tell you about 12, 12 votes against chair, 8 votes in favour, so that motion falls. Right, so that uh, motion uh, does not stand. We move on to the next motion in the name of uh, Assembly Member Buff, which is about overcrowding, and I believe 
uh, there's an altered version to the original motion which has been circulated. Is that correct? I'm assuming, Chair, that that altered motion includes the helpful amendment by the That's been group. circulated, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. So would you like to move uh, uh, the motion, Assemblymember Buff, and then uh, uh, I believe uh, Assemblymember Hall is seconding it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can, I can I first thank the Green Group who have proposed a helpful amendment to the motion, which I enthusiastically accept. I'm less thankful for the other amendment, which wishes to talk about something that is not in the mayor's power, based upon a falsehood, and removes the call for transparency in the amended motion. You know, it, Karen Buck MP, in a response to a tweet from the Resolution Foundation, which showed that 16% of Londoners lived in overcrowded conditions, uh, said, try living through this on the 16th floor with three kids on one, in one bedroom or with twins with autism but no garden, or with a mum and dad sleeping on the living room floor so a severely disabled child can have a bedroom. And she is not the only elected fisher, official to recognise the severe problems London has with the availability of larger family-sized homes. The Assembly has, on a number of occasions, made representations to the Mayor to come up with a target or a strategy to tackle the problem. The Labour group embarrassed him into changing some work, wording in the London plan to mention the word overcrowding, but I'm afraid despite their valiant effort, it remains largely unchanged. So let's rattle through what the Mayor's arguments are. First of all, the Mayor says that the London plan for the first time requires all boroughs to set size mixes for low-cost rented housing. Actually, this is what they've always done, and it's not quite right. It does mention that the boroughs should come up with their size mixes, but here's the killer. It said that such a mix should take into account the cost of delivering the, the, the larger uh, units and the availability of grant. Well, Assembly, uh, there is no extra grant for family-sized properties, and the cost of delivering a larger unit will always be more expensive than delivering a one-bedroom flat. So it fails on that test. Secondly, the mayor that sits, claims that family size units are defined in the London plan, 4.29 for your reference. This specification is only in one paragraph and relates only to the redevelopment of existing homes. The definition of family sized homes is not in the glossary, which is why we are continuing, why TfL, for example, are continuing to describe for example, in their redevelopment of High Barnet Station, two bedroom flats as family size. The other contention he has, and this, the, um, uh, the Labour Amendment hints on this, is that the Mayor has no power to dictate size mix. Well, yes, he does. He is fully enabled to be able to, along with the limits for uh, uh, the, the targets for affordability, he can also include size mix. Now, this is a very peculiar time because the Deputy Mayor for Housing, who was a very, very active member of the Planning Committee, when in March 2018, it, uh, that committee recommended to the Mayor that the plan needs to set targets for the development of larger homes and to alleviate overcrowding. He actually wrote to the then Deputy Mayor and said, there has been cross-party concern on the London Assembly about the need to ensure we have policies in place to tackle overcrowding and to ensure that we are building enough family-sized homes. In his letter to Mr Copley, the then Deputy Mayor said, we need to do more about the range of steps we are taking to ensure overcrowding is a priority and to reflect suggestions like yours, which were included KPIs, in the London plan in, for measuring bed spaces. Is there a target? No. Is there a KPI? <laughs> no. The mayor also makes much of the mayor's of downsizing the idea of building smaller flats to accommodate those who may not wish or who may choose not to underoccupy. There are already incentives for downsizing. They have been there since at least 1982 when I was elected a councillor. Housing allocation officers leap at the chance to encourage people to smaller properties, often with cash incentives. This is nothing new. The trouble is. The, these family-sized properties are few and far between, and the larger properties just simply are not there. 
assembly. We shouldn't wait for things to happen. We should make things happen. If the assembly persuades the mayor to review his housing policies and include transparency in the light of the COVID-19 experience, then it will be, have been seen to have made a positive contribution towards alleviating the misery that many Londoners have had to experience over the last few months. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Assembly Member Hall, do you want to second it? I will second, Chairman, and I will reserve my right to speak later. Right. We have a Labour amendment uh, to this motion uh, uh, proposed by Assembly Member Qureshi and seconded by Assembly Member Sahota. Uh, can I ask uh, proposer of the motion, uh, are you prepared to accept the amendment? Prepared to accept, yeah, the, the amendment along with our, our one, our amendment. Uh, yeah. You mean me? You want to know yes. if I want to accept it? Yeah. No, I, I do not accept the amendment, as I believe it to be a <coughs> amendment. Well, uh, in, in that case, uh, we will have uh, two separate debates. Uh, or oh, can we have a... One whole debate, we, sorry, we will have uh, one whole debate, but uh, obviously we will we'll be taking uh, uh, two separate votes, first for the amendment, followed by one for uh, the, 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 the main motion. Uh, do you want to, uh, Assembly Member Qureshi, speak now in uh, support of your amendment? Thank you, Chair. Moving. And it goes as follows. Can I first begin by just reading out what our amendment actually says? This assembly also calls on the chair of the assembly to write to the Secretary of State for Housing, Communities and Local Government, Robert Jenrick, MP, on behalf of the assembly to urge the government to adequately fund truly affordable family sized housing in the capital instead of skewing funding towards one and two bedroom shared ownership properties. Our amendment is there to put on record our concern of the clear link between overcrowding and COVID-19 mortality. Um, that, but it doesn't rest solely with the mayor, but also government funding is an important part of the solution. You don't have to go very far to look at overcrowding disparities in London during COVID than my own neighbourhood in the city of Westminster when comparing fatalities between the Church Street locality and St James's and Mayfair. Church Street locality has one of the most densely packed localities in London has had 22 fatalities, while St James's and Mayfair a lot less densely packed has only had two fatalities. It also says something about the regeneration efforts that need to happen in Church Street should be mindful of this overcrowding and COVID link, uh, link that uh, has been clearly established in this instance. Overcrowding has already uh, been identified as a major uh, problem in London before COVID by the London Assembly. 22% uh, of uh, children in London li live in overcrowded uh, properties. 40% of those children in social rented sector live in overcrowded houses. Cam Buck happens to be my local MP, uh, and I'm fully uh, converse and support her statements about the overcrowding plight to many in London uh, during the per period of, of our down uh, uh, lockdown. At the same time, the Assembly's Planning Committee has also initiated a, dr a draft new, felt that the draft new London plan to build was emphasising too many one-bed one homes. The, the Assembly also felt strategic housing market assessment was completely at odds with evidence received about overcrowding, housing waiting lists and the need for large social rented houses, houses of three or four bedrooms. Now, the main mechanism to deliver affordable housing in London is, without any doubt, the grant funding. Yet such grant funding is conditional on half of the homes being social shared ownership when evidence suggests it should only be at most 28%. Furthermore, the grant funding from government is at a, a historical low in terms of the percentage of costs funded, just 20% with a subsidy gap of over 280 per new social rented home. This also needs to be increased to make uh, more affordable family housing. So while the government has extended the deadline for the affordable housing programme, providing flexibility to housing providers due to COVID-19, without further action, that's increased government funding and reducing the conditions of funding, like reducing the amount of shared ownership, the delivery of family housing in London in the COVID era 
is a lot more difficult without further government funding assistance. I move the amendment. Chair. Uh, thank you. Assembly Member Sahota, do you want to reserve, I, sorry, second I formally, formally or? I formally, uh, I formally second the amendment and reserve my right. Thank you very much. I have one indication and that is from uh, Assembly Member Bailey. Um, thank you, Chair. I just want to say a, a few things. Firstly, uh, also me, Chair. Sorry. Yeah. Firstly, as someone who's a youth worker for 20 years, the, the, the negative pressure that overcrowding produces for families in London is incredible. That's why I commend uh, the original motion to you. Um, beyond our political badges, we must get this higher up the agenda. The current situation being perpetuated by the mayor is to make three and four bedroom houses relatively more rare, so therefore families are under even more pressure. And as for the, um, the comments made by the um, um, Assembly Member Qureshi, you would have much firmer ground to stand on if the mayor had spent all the money he already has. To keep asking for money and you haven't spent the money that you have, you can understand why the government has received it received his, his request in, in, a, in a very um, unfavourable manner. Until the mayor changes his own policies, he cannot ask other people to change their policies. They have a policy that's blocking the delivery of affordable family-sized homes in London. The mayor needs to change first, and then we could all demand the government did something. Thank you, Chair. Right. Chair, I also indicated to speak... Assembly sure Member Barry, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so, yes, I wanted to say thank you to Assembly Member Boff um, for proposing this motion and for working collaboratively with me and accepting some additional wording from our group. Overcrowding is a concern for all parties, um, and we've shared this in the Housing Committee as well. And it's an unarguable point that we don't have the data we need to properly measure it or the funding. I've been petitioning the mayor to properly measure overcrowding since he first presented his draft housing strategy, and I'm pleased to join with you and support this motion. I disagree with the Labour amendment for two reasons. First, the changes to the new wording um, on collecting data create the impression that boroughs should do the work of a new comprehensive survey to get proper data we lack, and I strongly believe this should be done at a London level by the mayor. That's what I've always called for. Secondly, uh, the addition made, I support. We should lobby for more funding for family-sized homes from the government. But I can't support the deletion at the, of the section that asks for more data transparency from the mayor on the sizes of homes he is supporting, subsidising and delivering. That has to stay. Thank you. Right. I do not have indication of any other members who want to come in. So... Can I ask Assembly Member Hall if you want to, uh, a seconder, come in, or are you okay to formally That's second? That's fine, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, same with Assembly Member Sota. Yes, can I come in? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Chair, look, we all agreed that we need more families as housed in London. Overcrowding is an issue, and the COVID-19 crisis has shown uh, that families that have, lacked, have lived in multi-generational homes in overcrowding situation have done much worse. So we are all agreed that we need more family sized housing and particularly in the socially rented sector. But how do you achieve that? The funding we get from the government has attachment to it that only 50% that, that of those houses that are built must be in, um, in shared ownership or, 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 or with the, a form of affordable housing ownership with it. And that puts a restriction on the mayor on how that funding can be used. And, and I think that the government right is being let off the hook here. We're all agreeable to the fact that the mayor should do more and the mayor can do more, but his hands should not be tied behind his back. And that's why we move this amendment right, is to make sure that the government works in unison with the mayor to, afford the, to, to give us social housing. And that's why we move the amendment right. Thank you. Right. Thanks very much. Uh, ca can I ask uh, the mover of amendment uh, if I uh, want to sum up? Can, Some, uh, Chair, can I come in? Uh, okay. Just, uh, yeah, okay. Sorry. Um, I, I can't use the hand signal. You, you can. I'm allowing you to speak on this debate if you want to. 
I just want to say that um, it's, I can't disagree with anything that's been put forward by, um, by the mover of the motion and um, Susan Hall. And um, it's, it's, we've, for years and years now, we've known that overcrowding has surpassed all records um, in the private and the social rented sector. And it's, it's really impacted on families, particularly in social housing. And we know read across between public health and between overcrowding and COVID. And we know that people on no income, but disproportionately people from black and minority ethnic communities are really affected by this. Five times more families um, from black and ethnic minority communities are over, living in overcrowded homes than white families. And we also know that apart from the overcrowding evidence, we have evidence of waiting lists. We have evidence of the erosion, the erosion of social housing. And we're not keeping up with the numbers that are lost by building more. And all that's there. And we have worked so hard together as an assembly to make sure that the mayor's strategic housing market assessment doubles the number of family size housing recommended by the Schmar. And that's there now. And that will be, and it's up to 44% across all sectors. That's family housing, three and four beds. But what, what we have to admit is that the mayor has a lot of referred schemes coming in. And we've asked that this should be the starting point. These recommendations on levels of family housing should be the starting point when the mayor looks at referred schemes. And we have to really hold him to account on making sure that we get that, you know, that third in social rented housing, that we get the others in the private sector and so on. Now, boroughs have the ability to actually say what they need. They can say what level of family size housing they want. And it's up to them. But the reality is that there's a yawning gap between what they're saying they need and what the supply can be. And I really think we have to look at the letter that the Secretary of State sent to the mayor in March, in which he says he recognises the need for more family homes in London. He recognises that. And he doesn't want the London plan to be to the detriment of that. And I think why we put this amendment in is because we need to be able now to write to the Secretary of State and say, from the Assembly, and say how much we have worked to improve the London Plan, the Strategic Market Housing Assessment, but there is the missing part, which is that the mechanism for delivering what we need is with the government. And we need the government to recognise that the case we've made in terms of the need for this because of COVID has absolutely heightened that. And we need to let him know that shared ownership doesn't really work in London. And it certainly doesn't work for the families that we're talking about on low income who are so crucial to the survival of this city. And we need to say all that. We need to say that Two and a half billion over five years doesn't really provide you with the money you need to provide this housing. And so we want him to play his part. Now, and that's why we've moved the amendment. And as I said, there's nothing, there's nothing to disagree with otherwise. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Assembly Member Cameron. Uh, Assembly Members, unfortunately, we have bad news that uh, uh, our webcast isn't going out. So we do have uh, broadcasting issues. So we tried to sort it, but uh, have failed. So uh, we have to adjourn now. And uh, once uh, it's sorted, uh, uh, we will have to resume our business again. So do apologize, but uh, no option but to adjourn no. at this point in time. Yeah. Chair. Navin, Navin yeah. before you do, Navin, yeah. uh, can I just say that we have a, a FREP meeting at 3.30 to deal with some, some statutory business which we have to deal with today. Uh, and, and noted. Chair, can I, can um, I...
Andrew, oh, just yeah. to explain, oh. um, the FREP, at the moment, there is a problem with the GLA's website. The FREP meeting would also be affected because if we can't webcast, it's not uh, a legally compliant meeting. So we're just going to take a quick pause to try and sort the, the technology. Please bear with us. Can I, can I ask, Chair, um, if we're going to stop for, say, 10 minutes, that's fine. If it's longer than